Oh, that's that's bad news, mate. Thank, thanks, thanks for telling me. I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll call on his wife and. Uh, yeah. Could you include me on that because I don't know their address off then? Yeah, yeah. Leave it, leave it to me, mate. I'll, 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 uh, I'll, I'll go knock on her door and speak to her rather than uh, send her a cold mm -hmm. note. You know. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Chairman, we are live. Good morning. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Adult Care, Health and Wellbeing, the Cabinet Panel on Thursday, the 15th of July. I'm just going to um, make some Chairman's announcement. Um, as you're aware, we're um, due to the coronavirus pandemic, the Council will be holding this meeting electronically in accordance with um, our relevant um, the regulations. Members of the public are also welcome to attend this meeting in an electronic capacity, and there is a link on our website um, for, for them to do so. And anyone that's joined us, you are most, most welcome. Members of the council are asked to keep their microphones switched off until called to speak. It's for background noise. Um, once they've finished speaking, cameras may be, um, once they've finished speaking, cameras may be left on throughout the meeting if members wish. I think it's good to see you all, 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 all on screen as much as possible. If you experience connection or other technical issues, relax, don't panic, these are the times we work in, it may help to switch your camera off. Cameras should be switched on if and when speaking in this meeting. And I would ask you to, to do that if at all possible. That, that we can see can see each other, um, if not being in the, in the, in the same same um, committee room as each other. To indicate a wish to speak, members should use the raise the hands function. Use of the meeting chat function is exclusively in this meeting for voting. At the end of the debate of each item of business, there will be a vote. Members should vote using the meeting chat function by indicating for, against or abstain. I will declare the result after each vote. Breaks of at least 15 minutes will be held every two hours and will be taken after a speaker in the debate has finished speaking. If we are voting, the vote will be concluded before the break is taken. Other breaks will be incorporated as, as appropriate or as, as deemed necessary. So members of the committee, um, I would like you to introduce yourselves. Mm -hmm. So starting, um, I'm gonna start with Ron at the top. You're at the top of my screen, Ron. Ron at the top. <laughs> Sorry, Stella, you caught me out there, I'd muted. Uh, uh, Ron Tyndall, I'm a Liberal Democrat ca uh, councillor for Hamel Hempstead St Paul's and the Liberal Democrat spokesperson for Adult Care. Excellent, thank you, Ron. Nigel? Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm Nigel Bell. I'm the uh, Labour councillor for West Watford. Thank you. Thank you. Peter? Hi, I'm Peter Hebden. I'm the Conservative County Councillor for Hatfield East. Excellent. Calvin? Oh. Chair, I'm Helen Campbell. I'm subbing for Calvin. Uh, Welcome, Calvin. Helen. Yeah. Welcome. And Tony? Hi, I'm Tony Kingsbury. I am the Conservative uh, County Councillor for Wellin and Vice Chairman of this committee. Thank you. Um, uh, right, and R R Richard looks like he's on the phone. Yes, hang on, Paul. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. I'm having some IT problems, and I'm trying to consult with uh, the, the, the excellent officers at County. But Richard Thake, member for Nebworth and Codicut, um, and oh, first, so oh, the first time on adult I don't care. The problems are sorted. Um, I, I will do. Yes, they're brilliant. They're, 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 they're brilliant. I'll leave it to me. I'm, I'm, I'm on the case. Have I missed? So Helen's on screen. Excellent. You're there. I can see you, Helen. It's fine. And Fiona. Fiona Guess, Conservative member for Hemel Hempstead Northwest. 
and a practicing community pharmacist. Thank you. As, as, have I have I missed anyone that's attending on the yes. as membership? Yes. Sorry, Leslie. Uh, Leslie Green Smith, Conservative Councillor for Gross Oak and Berry Green Division. And Paul. Hello, I'm Paul DeCourt, new Liberal Democrat Councillor for Hartmanden North East. And Pete and Peter is there. Right, membership changes. The only one I've been able to observe is Helen. Is Helen stepping in? Is that correct? Am I allowed to be here? Who are you? <laughs> I'm David Barnard. Apologies, I'm the, David. Apologies. I'm the Conservative member for Hitchin Rural. Sorry, I, when I said who are you, I couldn't see where the voice was coming from. I know who you are. So don't, don't, don't take that the wrong way. Uh, I've gone through life being that way. <laughs> if you can see my screen, everything's all over the place and it's it's you hear a voice and then you have to detect the voice. So I know very well that you are here. I, I, I saw you here at the beginning. OK, let's let's move on. So uh, apologies. Uh, Kelvin Horner, uh, who's being substituted by uh, Helen Campbell. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and, uh, and noted. Um, membership interests. Have we anything to any pecuniary interests or declarable interests to 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 note this morning? OK. All right. OK, let's proceed. Let's proceed with meeting. We've got uh, starting with the minutes. I'm inviting you to agree the minutes of our last meeting, Adult Care, Health and Wellbeing, which was held on the 23rd of June 2021. Have, are those minutes accepted? Any comments on those minutes? Agreed. No comments? I haven't missed anyone. I can't see any hands up or any hear any voices. So we'll take those minutes as accepted. Moving on to the next item, which is public petitions. None have been received. Moving to agenda item three, send, the SEND, SEND strategy 2022 to 2025. The report of the Director of Children's Services. Um, we have Joe Fisher presenting, the Operations Director of Children and Young People. Thank you very much, Chair. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jo Fisher, um, and yes, I'm the Operations Director for Children and Young People. I have a couple of colleagues with me, um, Danny and David. Um, Danny, could I ask you just to um, prepare your presentation on the screen while I just do some comments by way of an introduction? Just checking you're yep. with me. Yep, of course, Jo. Thank you, Danny. Um, OK, so, uh, yeah, what we intend to do today is to provide you with an overview of our draft and refreshed uh, SEND strategy for 2022-25 and just invite your feedback and your comments, including on our proposed uh, timeline for stakeholder engagement. Um, I'm, I'm aware that a number of you on this uh, meeting um, heard a very detailed presentation at a panel for children, young people and families yesterday. Um, so what we're going to do today is provide you with a shorter presentation. We're not going to go into the depth of detail around data that we did yesterday. However, I do have David Butcher with me, who is our data expert, and we can pick up any of your questions around uh, data and trends um, when, when we come to your questions at the end. So just by way of a very brief sort of introduction and scene setting, this refreshed strategy that you, you have in front of you um, builds on and really takes to the next level our SEND transformation programme that we launched back in 2019, which has the key aim of improving outcomes for children, um, young people and their families who, uh, with SEND, but also really better managing the steep increase in demand that we've seen in past years and the, the massive increase in costs that we've seen across the whole of the social education and health system for children and young people with SEND. And in Hearts, 
in Hertfordshire, we have seen a massive increase in education healthcare plans, over 100% increase in the past uh, five years. Um, and alongside that, increasing complexity of needs, particularly around social communication um, and also social, emotional, mental health needs of children and young people. And with that, a correlation in terms of the numbers of children who are being placed in increasingly specialised provision outside of Hertfordshire. Um, which has not just an impact on the outcomes for children, young people and their families, but also on the public purse. So in the last two years, we've made some significant inroads in really addressing some of the key priorities for children and young people. We've reformed our funding for children with SEND in mainstream schools to incentivise a sort of more collective responsibility for children with SEND across mainstream provision. But we've also put in place a new special school place uh, strategy which has the uh, very clear intention of increasing places in special schools in Hertfordshire by over 300 in the next three years. We have also got plans to increase specialist provision alongside our mainstream schools for children with social and communication needs um, by over 176 places in the next three years. Um, so there's a lot going on and indeed by this September we will have an additional 70 places places for children and young people. In terms of transition into adulthood, which I um, recognise might be of particular interest to this panel, and there's been a real focus on transition pathways and support, particularly for children moving from our um, special schools into colleges locally, but indeed from colleges into work, supported internships, apprenticeships, and those pilots have had real success in the last two years and we're looking at how we embed them moving forward and alongside that we've reshaped our advice information support for families and children bringing all into one place um, so we've got a sort of unified front door and our local offer website for children and young people has been revamped and co-produced with families so that it really does provide a sort of live um, source of information for children and young people and we saw that they made really good use of it during the recent pandemic. So moving on to our new strategy and I'll hand over to Danny now, really what we're doing here is we're setting out our aspirations um, to be collaborative, to be modern, agile and getting it right for children and young people as we move forward. I'm really um, pleased to see that our new strategy sets out both the breadth of activity needed to get it right for children and young people. But we're also clear about our vision, our outcomes, the benefits and how we're going to get there. So, Danny, if you want to take us through some of the highlights now, then we can take questions um, from members. Thanks, Joe. Can I just check that everybody can see the slide? Is that OK? Yeah. Brilliant, excellent. So, um, so yes, I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through how basically we've got to the draft that you see before you today, um, how it's been created and how it's and also the rationale behind behind the current and, and new SEND strategy. So as Joe highlighted, we have a current SEND strategy that will run through to 2023. However, there was a feeling that, you know, due to the pandemic and impacts there, um, positive impact on the SEND transformation programme, but also that increase in need on our services that actually now would be a really timely refresh, um, particularly because we had quite a lot of learning as well through that pandemic period. Um, so basically that the idea was to have this refresh behind the scenes, a dedicated task and finish group has worked together to develop this draft. So this hasn't been led by one particular area, say education, this has really been a collaborative approach with professionals from across um, health, education, social care, but also parents, families, carers, our experts by experience, head teachers, primary and mainstream heads um, and special heads have come together to create this draft um, with the view obviously that we could then take out for further public consultation. I think it's also really important to say that at the moment we're also about to launch our new children's and young people's plan. So that obviously covers all of our children's services and we've made sure there's a goal and thread that flows all the way through from our children's young people's plan all the way through into our new send strategy so it's really tightly aligned everything from our impact our progress our measures from that from that top tier umbrella level 
So the first thing that I'd really like to share with you today is that the current vision, um, the draft vision that we, we have created. Um, and I say this has been created by that task and finish group. Um, and really the key line I'd really like to draw your attention to is that we would like the tagline at the bottom that send is everybody's business to throw flow through all of our communications um, and engagement we do from here on in. Um, I, we really believe in this, this vision. We're obviously keen to hear your feedback, but um, you know, the key thing is we want our, our children and people we send to lead happy and fulfilling lives. Um, but yeah, please do, if you've got any comments on, on the vision, we're, we're more than happy to take those. One of the key challenges often with, with a strategy is that they're quite um, large, wieldy documents, aren't they? And they normally start off with a really great launch and everyone's right behind them. But because they're quite unwieldy, they can often end up a little bit dusting on a shelf and quite hard to keep living and breathing. So of course we have the main strategy that you see in front of you, but behind that, or the key part of that strategy is the SEND ambitions. So we would like to have obviously the main SEND strategy and then these five key ambitions that you literally, we can literally pull out of that strategy and make sure they're living and breathing through the lifetime of this strategy. Um, the way they've been developed is, um, so, so they, they launched with doing words. So the one in front of you here is around our workforce. And we wanted to make sure they have real action behind them. And that's why they lead the doing word, like as you can see before you, the word and how do we enable our workforce and our professionals to, to deliver the, the services and support that our young people and families need? Um, so yeah, so action is the key part of all of our ambitions. Um, and then from there, they start with how it's going to make the impact. How will our children, young people, families and professionals feel if we're getting our ambitions right? If we're really leading this change and implementing this change, how we know that we're making that difference to the people that matter? So every ambition starts with how will people feel if we're getting it right? And then behind um, um, those sort of uh, impacts are actually the actions that we're going to do. So this gives you a very broad overview behind uh, the, the public facing document. There'll be a large action plan that our social care, education, health colleagues will be signing up to and feeding into their service plans. But we want to be really transparent with our families and communities around, around what we are actually going to be doing. And then linked to that public progress and impact measures. So we can then report back regularly to our communities, to the public around actually what's our progress looking like. Um, we look to do that through um, communicating via the local offer and also having a feedback loop that way. So families can come back and go, yep, yeah, this is working, but no, you're still not quite getting this right. Or we haven't seen that impact where we are. Um, and again, we'll have this will link into the SEND dashboard, which will report into SEND leadership groups. So that our internal um, services and professionals can see how we're progressing and be held accountable to. Um, we're also looking to link that into the, the broader children's services reporting dashboard as well. Again, to stop duplication, but ensure that's transparent um, and communicated clearly. So these are the public documents that will go out as, as the ambitions, what we're going to do and how we're going to measure. But I do want to reassure that behind this is a much tighter sort of governance model that will ensure we're doing that tracking. So hopefully um, this is our ambition for, for the engagement plan and hopefully with your endorsement um, of sorry, your, your, your agreement today, this is a, is a great plan to move forward with. Um, this is a, sort of the key engagement activity, but we're keen to get your feedback as other things you think maybe I've missed or we've missed. Um, the first thing to sort of highlight is the community events. Um, we've got four community events happening across across the county. We've tried to spread them really fairly, so across the quadrants. Um, but obviously appreciate that at the moment with the pandemic, not everybody feels confident coming out to events. So there will be online events happening as well. So the idea of the events that are going out into the community are there's no point in us going out and waving a send strategy around because that doesn't mean anything to our community and our families. What we would like to do is go out and promote the um, services, support and organisations in these areas that support families with SEND. So not only can the families come um, to us and meet and us and find out about what's going to be happening in the new SEND strategy, we can communicate what's already available and the direction of travel. And hopefully they'll be able to take away information, tools and support networks from these events. Um, and as well as that, we've also tied in with Mudlarks, which is a local um, charity organisation uh, where uh, young children and young people with SEND grow and make and, and do the catering um, at a local coffee shop. So we're going to use them to, to obviously share uh, and sell goods at these events. So as well as the, the 
physical events, we're also running a series of online events as well. So these are going to be called the Send It to Everybody's Business webinars um, for health, social care and educational professionals. Appreciating that it's much easier now to do things online and join things to reach a, a broader group um, of people. Um, and these are focused on key areas of, of the Send strategy and the ambitions and do a bit of a call to action really. How can we really drive this forward and work together? The other bit that's, that I think is really lovely that we're, we're really excited about is the SEND strategy drawing competition. Um, so we're really keen to generate proper real images to go into the SEND strategy, but also onto the local offer. Um, so we're looking to run a drawing competition um, across early years all the way through into FE and post 16. Um, and these images will be um, generated and submitted into the local offer so we can do a public vote on 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 the favorites for, for sort of competition entry and um, but the images will focus on who our young people look up to who they'd like to be when they grow up um, and who do they respect and admire um, so yes yeah, so those images will then be used on the local offer but also in in the send strategy as well Looking now at the school and education setting engagement, um, which is obviously a key area, we um, and how we can drive this through schools and, and our educational settings. We're looking at developing a SEND strategy briefing pack. Um, this will include, of course, um, the SEND strategy ambitions in, in easy read, information about services and organisations that, that are available in the local area, um, and information of how schools and colleges can get involved in things like the drawing competition as well, um, as well as posters um, and visuals to go around the school. Um, and these will go out to all primary and secondary and FE settings uh, for use. Um, and alongside that for educational professionals, um, online discussion webinars, so where we can also come together and talk about how we can uh, support on current challenges that are happening across schools and settings around inclusion with SEND, but also how we can measure success and if we're, how we're getting it right. But really, again, a call to action of how we're working together to improve services and support for SEND. Um, and also, you know, look at how we can be accountable and measure progress. Just what you might like to see, this is a current design link uh, for the, the drawing competition um, and obviously really keen for that to go live for approval for legal from legal now for this to go live in September. Um, and then on from today, um, as, as we said earlier, we've been to Children and Young People's and, and Families panel yesterday and we've had um, endorsement to move forward, but really keen again to have, have you know, your ideas and thoughts around and what we're trying to achieve um, and, and sort of a nod really to, to go ahead and do our engagement from September onwards. And back to you, Jeff, that's OK. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, uh, oh, apologies, Thank I had a bit of an echo there. Um, Chair, can I um, hand over to you for questions, please? Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for that for that presentation. And send is everybody's business. So uh, questions surrounding. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Panel. I can. See, okay. I've got the order and not down by the side. R um, Richard. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, Stella. Um, I think Ron Tindall was first, but I'll, but I'll. Since you called Don't me, I'll, this, this, this is a comment, uh, uh, an observation rather than a question. But uh, I think, I think the strap line is brilliant. Um, the concept of, of wraparound, uh, you know, whole, whole family care is something which I think has been. Uh, embedded into the county council for a while and it's absolutely right that, 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 that this is where it goes um the comment is and i appreciate that the need to properly consult uh, to ensure that this is done right but january 22 is a long time ahead for a lot of young people who might be benefiting from these improvements so uh, clearly i i i expect you might be beginning to trial this with your work, even though we're consulting on it um, unofficially. But I mean, you see where I'm coming from. It, 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 it looks a huge improvement in both conceptually and, and in, in, in delivery. Uh, it, it really will help if it's done properly. Uh, but, you know, every time it's delayed, a young person isn't benefiting from the new initiative. So uh, it, that's the comment. It, 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 I'm delighted very, very pleased and right. an excellent and clear presentation. Thank you so much. And by the way, so my uh, IT problems have been fully resolved. The team were brilliant. So, Excellent. And thank Chair, you. Chair, can I just quickly... The IT, um, 
And, I, and thank you, Richard. Um, I Chair, may I just quickly respond to Richard? I, I know it wasn't Absolutely. a question, but I, I think he makes a really good point. So thank you, Richard, for your comments. And just to reassure both yourself, but also the panel, um, we haven't taken our foot off the gas. This is part of a programme of continuous improvement that we started two years ago. So there are nine work streams up and running that have been up and running for the last two years, really focused on getting operational grip around getting it right for children and young people with SEND. Um, but we know we've got more to do, and that's what the new strategy is about. It's really about taking it to the next level with a real focus on early intervention, making sure that children and young people get the right help early on at the right time so that their needs don't escalate into needing you know, specialist out-of-county provision far away from their homes and their communities. We want to get it right for children in Hertfordshire, within our local you know, within our county boundaries, within our local schools. And that's the focus of the new programme. But there's a lot of work that we're already doing that will not stop and that's very focused on getting it right. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. OK, um, Ron, Councillor Tyndall. Thanks very much. Uh, Ron's fine, Stella. Uh, yeah, uh, Joe, uh, a couple of points. One, uh, uh, first of all, I, I sit on the management committee of the Decorum Educational Support Centre, so uh, it's a bit close to my heart. Is uh, What is the time, has the time taken for assessments improved? Because it was running, quite, there were quite some delays at one time. Has that picked up at all or have you any plans to improve that at all? So, Ron, I suspect there are two types of assessments. If you're talking about the assessment timeline for children yeah. to have an education, health and care plan, um, Hertfordshire has continued to do really well on that. David's here, but I think we're around 90%. Is that right, David? And we, we've, we've never really dropped lower than around, I think, 85 during the pandemic when some parents chose to delay yeah. the, the, the assessment because, we, because health colleagues have been redeployed. So I wonder... If you're concerned about timelines, I wonder whether you're talking about the, the diagnostic pathway uh, and assessments it, around diagnosis. Yeah, it's it's when the school gets a new uh, entrant and then they can't actually enter the school until the assessment's done. And sometimes that takes the time. So it's really a question of when the assessment is, how long it takes for the assessment to be completed rather than the number of assessments. Right, I, so I, within I, our timeline, there's a 20 week, you, I think you are talking about the education, health and care plan. So that's a 20 week timeline. Yeah. Um, and and there, there are, we, we're, we're ahead of both national statistics and regional st statistical neighbours on that. It's around 90%. David, can I just ask you to just remind me of the exact um, percentage if he's on this? Is David Butcher on the call? Well, you know, it's around 90 percent. He might have dropped out. Can you tell us whether it's a six weeks wait, a, a two month wait? Uh, no, before? It takes 20 oh. weeks for most of our children, which is the timeline that we're expected to do it within. And we're achieving yeah. that for over 90 percent of our children, um, which is actually a really good result. Um, we have got delays elsewhere in the system, Ron, both mm. in terms of diagnosis, which yeah. we're working with health colleagues to really drive forward. And we've seen a significant improvement in that in the last year, but we've got more to do. And the other area of delay, which I'm just wondering, you know, whether that's what you're, you're referring to, has been around reviewing mm. our, our education, health and care plans. Now, we've acknowledged that that has not been good enough um, in the past few years. We've put in place a new team focused on that in the the last six months and they've made real inroads in improving that we're still not good enough but we've made real inroads and and by the end of um by the time we get into the new autumn term we should have a real um evidence base to say that we've improved significantly on that too um so yeah i mean by uh, all means that's if, fine joe thanks very yeah. much no, it was just a just a quick passing question. My main concern is, as as you mentioned at your opening, is the is the eighteen to twenty five group that transition yeah. period, which really uh, involves our our cabinet panel. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the only mention of the not to twenty five group is on um, page forty one on the brokerage team. I just wondered, are is there a, a strategy being developed for for that group going forward? 
for the older age group, sort of 16 to yeah. 25. Yeah. yeah, yeah. we've got a work, um, a work stream, Preparation for Adulthood, that's co-chaired between colleagues in health, uh, adult services, sorry, and colleagues in children's services. Um, and, and that's got a very clear work stream. Um, Dan, Danny's on the corner, she facilitates that, but just to give you some headlines, that programme, as I mentioned very briefly, has piloted some approaches, both from transition from our special schools in Hertfordshire into some of our local colleges, Oaklands, Hearts College, etc. Um, really successfully, but also address the issue that many parents and colleges have raised with us, which is young people, once they get onto a college place, often don't have a meaningful pathway out of college into work, training, um, supported internships, apprenticeships, all the, all the things that we would expect for any of our children. Mm. So we've also really focused on getting that bit right. And we've got um, some some pilots around um, making sure that we've got the right level of hands-on support for those young people, reaching into some of our local businesses to support them into work experience, etc. Um, so there's that going on too. Alongside that, we've piloted health passports for our young people as they, as they move into adulthood. So um, really making sure that we support that transition into adult health services as well. And lastly, I would mention that we've worked really closely with adults uh, so colleagues in adult services to think about the type of accommodation and housing young people need as they move into adulthood. Lots of young people and parents have told us that they're teenagers when they leave home. A, they want to leave home, but secondly, they want to live with friends that they have something in common with in smaller accommodation. Um, and so again, we're feeding that into our sort of commissioning framework for house, housing and accommodation um, as uh, for, for, for young people as they move into adulthood. I think there are still some challenges, Ron, about making sure that we share the right level of data with um, adult colleagues in commissioning um, so that uh, adult services can commission um, what is needed. And we are working jointly with adult services to make sure that we're providing the right level of data. And I think we've got some work to do on that. And it's very much a focus of the work stream that I mentioned earlier. Danny, I don't know if you, you want to mention anything else. I, I just wanted to get some key highlights. I think that, that covers all of it. PFA covers um, sort of like the health transition, uh, accommodation, employment um, and education pathways. Um, so, yes, so that, that covers all of the key pillars of transition into, into adulthood. Um, but, yeah, but of course, we have lots of information we can share on that if people would like that at a later date. Mm. Uh, that can, thanks for that. Perhaps that can be arranged at some point when, yeah. uh, when, the, when the working party has, has, uh, has, has got something to show us. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Thank course. you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Nigel, Councillor Bell, you have no. your hand raised. OK. Thank you, Chair. And obviously I won't go into too much detail because obviously I was at the uh, Children's Services panel yesterday with your detailed presentation and it, and it was obviously very good. Um, I mean, I did say a couple of things, uh, especially as I think all county councillors know the, the, the most um, sometimes the most complex and the most difficult uh, case where we get our send from our send issues from our our families and I mean over the years I've, I did say yesterday here we go again but I actually I'm not trying to be too cynical but I think send we've had lots of different reviews over the years and if this does succeed in uh, getting a better offer and a better deal for our families with send then obviously I'll be pleased and especially when it comes to the tribunal figures and appeal figures as you uh, went into yesterday and briefly touched on here uh, and I think it's important when you say um, you're going to be measuring progress that's important to see how you measure the progress uh, and also the key thing to me is those five themes are very good and also when it's key thing is how parents can if you like be able to cut through the bureaucracy and get an easy access online or whether they just phone up to be able to get you know their child uh, mostly children uh, into um, help and get help from the county so if we can get that access and I know in, on a lot of the report you talk about listening and it's neat it's be able to listen to complaints as well as compliments taking on board uh, and all the other stuff on here which is very good and I mean the it's important that people can, as I say, have these get access to these webinars. I'm sure you'll probably, as I said yesterday, you'll probably uh, give notice to parents and people so they can get in touch via them. And also those um, those meetings dates you've set up that that that's also good. And again, they need to be um, 
have properly given notice. Well, I do, uh, as Ron said, obviously, out particularly for this committee, this panel, uh, it's about the 18 to 25 that we're more concerned with. And of course, there are quite a lot of families that have um, uh, concerns that that go over into adult care. Um, so I'm pleased that you're, there's a reassurance there. The other thing was on, I think I mentioned it briefly, when yeah, someone did yesterday, on the uh, BAME community and those um, families um, uh, of uh, different communities as to how you're going to make sure you'll get a, get across to them to actually make sure that they uh, fully uh, understand the, 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 these new um, uh, these new ideas and new rules. So I'd, I'd be interested to hear about that. But, you know, obviously, overall, I support this. Uh, uh, and, you know, I'm sure you'll come back to us as well as mainly Children's Services with uh, progress on this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Response. Um, Fiona, Councillor Councillor Guest, you have your hand. It's the order in which I've got it down. I see other hands up too. Two points here. The first one is on the on Appendix One, and that's the Send Strategy, page eleven, and it refers to getting it right, being that children feel safe and heard. So how are we engaging with children and young people? That's the first point. And the second one is, I see there's a lot of references to transition. Back in my first term as a county councillor in the early 2000s, I was really concerned about transition. I'm delighted to see that it's still on the radar and a lot has developed between now and the early 2000s. So. Well done to everyone who's doing work on transition. Thank you. Fiona? Um, Danny, do you want to answer the question about how we're engaging with children and young people? You're on mute, Jack, Danny. Yes, of course, Fiona. So um, in regards to, to the point up until now and, and how we've sort of developed the, the strategy and get, got their engagement today, that has been through that task and finish group and with our, our two experts by experience. Um, so that's how we've, we've sort of built the strategy so far. Um, really key point around the feedback loop of making sure that actually with the strategy that we're getting it right um, and, and the progress point and the feedback loop. Um, we are looking at using the local offer to say this is how far we've got, this is the progress we've made and having a feedback loop option there for families and um, young people to come back to us and say, yes, no, this is working, no, but this still isn't right or seeing this in this part of the county, what are you doing about it? To have that feedback loop working all the way, all the way round. Um, we are also looking at the, the future of our Experts by Experience programme. So within the, the SEND Strategy programme, we've had two Experts by Experience that we've appointed and have worked with us um, over the last sort of 14, 15 months. Um, we do want to look at how we can embed that as a, as a, as a full-term programme, so a rolling programme of Experts by Experience coming into the authority to keep informing the work and, and the activity that, that we're undertaking. Um, again, to make sure the services are fit and developed based on, on people's feedback. And, and Dan, it's probably worth adding, although I, maybe people understand it from the report, that our experts by experience, the two young people you refer to, they were, um, I think, in their early 20s and yes. um, had, had uh, disabilities themselves. So we employed them within our team to help shape our, our programme of work over the last couple of years. Yeah, yes, Jen, and, and I just think it's really worthwhile to say as well so one of the um one of the the young women have a uh, complete an nbq with us in care level two and, and then they're now applying for roles to go into the next step of their career and i think that's been really beneficial for us to see the level of support needed the types of support but also how we can support with training as they're progressing through those roles excellent e excellent um paul councillor de court you have your hand raised yeah, the th thank you, Chair. Um, my question is about data, particularly relating to the the transition from eighteen into into our area of of interest. Um, I just wondered if how we're modelling uh, the longer term trends referred to early in the presentation as the increased demand and and how we're going to cope with that. I mean, it, for me, it seems likely to be some combination that increased demand of national legislation changes. Um, a greater diagnostics by county stroke schools of of need and then probably also something relating to more you know complexity of pre and, and, and antenatal care and how how children are 
are, are presenting themselves and and then on, on within that you then factor in the job that's being done by us um, by us I mean by the whole county at um, helping uh, young people up to the age of 18 to be more append, independent than they otherwise would which will obviously reduce the uh, financial implications moving forward and, and the and the resource implications beyond 18. Um, so I'd, I'd like a perspective on that and the reason why I ask it is is for me in a in a kind of political role is who do we go to in terms of if, when we require more funding so if it's if it's national legislation um, which may be highly appropriate then we go to national government to say ensure you fund that extra and you can imagine internally if we if we're thinking about those things so I just would we really appreciate some comments on that. That's fine. Thank you very much, Paul. It's a good question. And you're absolutely right. I mean, everything you described has contributed to the increasing demand we've seen across the SEND system. And, and it's just worth noting that the 2014 um, SEND reform put in place um, the education health care plans, but also expanded the age range, as I'm sure you're aware, mm. up to the age of 25, which just brought far more children and young people into the statutory system. Um, but, but I'll hand over here to David. He's done loads of modelling around this right. um, point and um, if he could, David, if I could ask you just to talk briefly on some of the modelling you've done around the older age range, then I can pick up the point about um, the, getting more money into the system. Mm. Lovely. Thank you, Joe. Good morning, uh, morning panel. Um, as uh, Danny and Joe have uh, talked about through that preparation for adulthood uh, work stream, looking to uh, really up that flow of information that's coming uh, earlier uh, to adult care uh, commissioning colleagues uh, to, to help plan for that. Um, Joe alluded to the um, uh, the extension to 25 that came with the uh, uh, said reforms in 2015 uh, and what we've seen is a steady growth uh, in terms of that 16 plus age group as a result we're not yet at the point of uh, of seeing the full effect of that extension um, we can see uh, moving into the the 20 21 year olds um, that, that that uptake is happening but we're not yet at the point but it's had full effect um, uh, which uh, intuitively makes makes sense if we think about the 2015 reform should take 10 years to to, to fully be be felt. In terms of the modelling, uh, I think there's uh, a, a couple of pieces that uh, are relevant in terms of the wider development. The first is uh, because of the moves around uh, funding uh, following plans much more than has been the case historically, uh, we're now building up a much clearer picture of uh, the profile of need uh, at the moment for mainstream uh, children. Uh, but also as those children move into to specialist placements. And what that will give us is a really good profile that, that will help inform uh, adult colleagues about the uh, the young people that uh, are likely uh, to, to be needed to factor into their planning. So that's, that's a change that we haven't uh, been able to quantify that in a way previously. Um, but over the next couple of years, as, as that fully beds in and extends across the age range, that will put us in a, in a really useful place. Um, what we are still seeing in terms of uh, new plans is that generally um, they're, they're uh, coming on board at key transition points, but largely that's moving from early years into to primary settings uh, and then from primary into to secondary. We, we see relatively few young people um, who are, uh, are coming onto plans uh, in those older groups. So generally, uh, we should be in a position that we we know about them uh, sooner, and with that that banding, we'll be able to, uh, I, I think, offer some more predictive information. Um, the other piece that uh, uh, I suppose is is relevant there is absolutely that point about independence, and and I think the uh, the thread around inclusion that very much runs all the way through the strategy is is that really key piece because preparing for independence uh, actually starts from the very early years, and that's that's a key theme not just in terms of the preparation for adult work stream, but also the, the early years work streams and then um, the, the supporting uh, supporting schools, settings, the community to be as, as strong as possible. So that very much fits, I think, with uh, the strategies that uh, our adult services colleagues have, have brought to that preparation for adult work stream. Thank you. Thank you, David. And then, uh, Paul, just to pick up on your point about money, funding, um, the, you know, the, the increasing 
um, level of demand we've seen across the SEND system and the increasing complexity of need that we're seeing is, as you can imagine, having a significant impact right across the system. And our high needs funding in Hertfordshire um, is incredibly stretched. Last year, we, we had an, an, an overspend in our high needs funding. Um, and whilst we've managed to pull it back and balance it this financial year, we are projecting if the current trajectory of, of need continues, as we're seeing, um, we're projecting a significant overspend in our high needs funding as we move forward in Hertfordshire. And it's worth noting that Hertfordshire has one of the lowest allocations in the country of high needs funding per head. I think we're around seventh lowest, but it's it's really much less than our statistical neighbours and comparable local authorities. Um, based on that, we are in regular um, contact, both with our local MPs, but also central government to say two things. One is that we'll do our part to manage demand as best we can by getting it right early on for children and young people, managing demand at the earliest point that we can. Um, and, and that's part of our SEND strategy and our SEND transformation programme. But secondly, we've been very clear that we need a continued injection of um, cash, of increased funding into our high needs block for Hertfordshire. Um, and we have been um, very clear in all of our correspondence with central government, local MPs, and indeed many people on this call about that need for increased funding into high needs, both in Hertfordshire, but also across the country. We're not the only local authority. Indeed, many more are experiencing far higher pressure than in Hertfordshire. Thank you. Thank you. Paul? Okay. okay. Yep. Helen, Councillor Campbell, you have your hand raised. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Thanks very much, everybody. And just, yes, I am sub uh, substituting another member today, so I'm not sure if I'm going to be on this panel again. I certainly plan to attend um, anyway. And I suppose that leads on to my... I did have a question which has partially been answered in some of the, the, the just very recent um, responses from, from David Butcher in particular. But I, I have to say I'm a little bit confused about which, which panel I'm on today. Um, and the reason for that is because I, I just would have expected a lot more focus on the 18 to 25 age group, not only in the report. Uh, I would have liked to have seen that SEND strategy report with a sort of special section, a special addendum uh, or, or just rejigged and targeted for this panel. I really am a bit stumped at the moment. Um, I know Ron said earlier on, he, he you know, it was difficult to sort of find any mention of, of this age group. And I agree with him. Um, and I think my personal feelings about that age group are often that they do get forgotten I'm not suggesting they've been forgotten I'm just this is constructive a constructive comment I would have expected to have seen a very um, focused uh, focus on that age group at this panel um, as part you know what are we doing for uh, young adults with special needs and disabilities I haven't got that answer I'm really sorry to say that but I'm just going to be honest um, but leading on from that, my my, and this is uh, this is a question asked from naivety and ignorance. Um, what happens to those young people at 25? I know there's a transition, but I don't know what that trans transition looks like. And I'd be really appreciative if one of the officers is just able to just fairly briefly just outline that, because I'm sure there are people on this panel who do know, um, but I don't. <laughs> and I'd really appreciate it just for a quick understanding. You know, I know it's not a sudden stop. At least I hope it's not a sudden stop in terms of assistance and support at 25. So what does that transition look like? Um, so, yeah, my first first ob first observation is well meant and constructive, but I, it's a real genuine one. And the second one is a question asked out of uh, newness. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Um, and I welcome your feedback. Thanks. I think, you know, I, I took it in the spirit that is intended. So thank you. And and I, I think that's definitely something for us to reflect on. Um, I wonder whether it could be helpful, um, Chair, if at a future meeting um, we worked with our colleagues in adult services who are part of our preparation for adulthood um, work stream to bring forward a report um, very much focused on that age range. If that's something that would be helpful to this panel, I'm very happy to make sure it happens. Um, and then, because there's a lot of work, um, Helen, that has been happening. Um, so I think it's about us making sure that we're communicating it to you on a regular basis, um, because we certainly are communicating back to the children, young people and families panel about what's going on for the lower age range on a regular basis. So maybe that's just a gap we need to close 
um, moving forward, and I'd welcome that opportunity. And secondly, what what happens post post twenty five? Yeah, I mean, it very much as you can imagine depends on on the particular circumstances and needs of, of a child. But but there are a number of different pathways. We certainly do, they certainly don't fall off a, a cliff. I mean, we, we do our best to make sure that they get continued support. Many will um, continue to get support through adult services. Um, uh, so our 0 to 25 children's care service works up to the age of 25. And then there's a very clear transition into adult services for those um, who need to be transitioned into adult services. But also, um, I think, our, you know, our life, our approach to lifelong learning, not just for um, learning for the younger age group in Hertfordshire, is something that's right at the centre of our skill strategy as we move forward. And I think, you know, it really does say, well, how do we continue to support our um, people um, into adulthood and across adulthood who might face additional barriers? Um, in terms of getting work, in terms of getting experience, in terms of, you know, just just living uh, a sort of productive life. And, and we've got a strong within adult services, there is um, a strong support service for that. And certainly we work very closely with them to make sure that children are from the age of 25 are supported on an ongoing basis. Um, but again, I think that's something that we need to be you know, shining the light on as we move forward. I, I was really pleased to see that our, our skills strategy for Hertfordshire that's currently under consultation, I think, has got lifelong learning, um, for, for particularly for people who might face additional barriers right at the heart of it. And I think, you know, that again is part of um, making sure that this cohort of young people get the right support as they move beyond the age of 25. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Helen new eyes to the panel um thank you for that for, for that question and joe yes we would we would welcome to coming back here with it with with the with, with detail with a more detailed sort of response on that one excellent be most welcome i have um peter councillor hebden's um hand raised thank you um yeah, I th I, first of all, I'd like to thank Helen actually for <laughs> refocusing on, uh, on 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 what this is about because I I've had a lot of uh, dealings over the last couple of years with a children's charity um, for uh, for people with autism, and and uh, and I, I've gone through the report and I've I've got a load of questions about uh, about numbers and data and all the rest of it and then um, and and then uh, actually. Get I, I lost focus on the fact. That I think that the, yeah, this, this committee is about the 18 to 25 year olds. Um, so I'm not going to ask all the questions uh, that that I got. Um, but, but but one of the anecdotal uh, issues, uh, complaints that, that, that's raised um, with me over the last over the last um, sort of year or so is, is that we, with um, the, the SEN officers, uh, there's a very high turnover. Uh, high sickness rates, uh, the the contact for the parents or the carers is always changing, and uh, it's always somebody new, um, and, and and there's only about sort of one, I think one or two employees who, who aren't managers. I, I mean, I, in a previous life, I, I I worked for the NHS for a while, and and everybody's a manager. I don't know if that's just the terminology. Um, within uh, within within this department as well um but uh yeah there seems to be more, more chiefs than indians and uh, an extremely high turnover of staff which makes it difficult for uh for, for the parents etc if you can, can you comment on that yeah absolutely thank you very much peter um just, but just taking in reverse order certainly we've got more frontline practitioners we have managers within our statutory send teams far more um so the structure um isn't particularly top heavy. Um, so uh, I'm very happy to share that structure with you if it would be helpful, but we do have far more frontline workers. Um, our SEND officers are frontline practitioners. Um, they are supported by team managers and then they are supported by service managers, but but they that, that level of support is needed, particularly given the complexity of need, but the frontline workers are, are far more prevalent. Um, but but to address your first point, which I, you know, I, th I think is a really valid one, um, and just to put it into context, you know, we, we have got, particularly in, in one one part of the county, um, a high a high turnover of staff, but but it is something we've struggled with, and indeed it's something with every uh, local authority is struggling with within their SEND teams. And it's in the context of this massive increase of demand that we've seen since 2014-15 when the SEND reform came in. 
Um, so caseloads within the SEND teams have increased. They've doubled. They've gone from being around 130 to, when I last looked, being around 270, 80 per, per worker. Um, and, and, and given the complexity of need that they're holding within that caseload, um, we, we've got we've got very busy frontline staff teams, which um, contribute, I'm not making excuses, but they contribute to some of the um, challenges that you've very well described, Peter. What we are doing about that is, uh, well, we, we're looking at two things. One is we're looking at how we put in place um, processes that are more efficient so that people can manage the workload more efficiently. An example of that would be we've put in a new database for managing caseloads that massively increase um, the, the speed at which people can manage their caseloads and do annual reviews. Um, but alongside that, we are taking really seriously the point about capacity. Um, the council invested half a million social care grant uh, about six months ago now, probably, into our SEND teams. And from that, we created a new team that deal with the annual reviews. Um, but it's still not enough because we still have high caseloads. And so we are now currently modelling around actually what is needed in terms of making sure we've got the right capacity in our frontline teams, what is needed to make sure that we can provide the type of service we want to provide for our children and families. And that's a piece of work that we'll, um, we'll have done that modelling within the next month or so, um, and we'll certainly be bringing it back to council for a discussion. Yeah, thanks. I, I mean, overall, I think the report is is very positive i mean, I mean uh, and and anecdotally what i hear is that from where from where uh, the 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 council was uh, sort of 10 years ago to where they are now uh, in relation to uh, send provision is uh, it's, it's it's in a different world you know it's it's just it's improved so much um but there's still a long way to go and um and I think that the I think the figures, you know, the, the data shows, you know, the, the, the cases have doubled the number of EHCPs, et cetera. And um, with the, one of my questions actually was going to be about the EHCPs and whether the uh, whether the is there a particular is there a high rejection rate? Is is people often find it difficult to navigate the process? Everybody says it's very very complicated. Um, so, so, you know, you've got, you've got 20 weeks to deal with it. Yeah. And you're dealing that in 90% of cases, but what, what, what's the sort of figures for, for rejections and, and approvals? Yeah, I'm going to hand over to David to give you the figures. I don't think we do too badly on that, actually, David. I think we're certainly comparable to our sort of uh, our statistical neighbours. And but I'll, I'll let you hand that. Ha uh, I'll hand over to you for that. Just to quickly pick up on the point about the complexity of the system. I think you're absolutely right, Peter. What we are looking at is how do we sort of stand alongside children and families much more strongly to help them co um, navigate what is inevitably a complex system across health, education and social care. And how do we simplify some of that? That's something we are looking at. Um, but I'll just I'll just let David comment on. Lovely. Yeah, go on, David. That, thank you, Joe. So in, in response to that, um, uh, I think we, we have seen that um, really strong rise in terms of the numbers of EHCPs overall. And as Joe set out and the, the paper talks about, um, you know, that's a faster rate of increase than we've uh, seen nationally or in terms of statistical neighbours. But in terms of the, the levels of requests for statutory assessment uh, and indeed the number of new plans, Hertfordshire is now uh, very much in line with those national uh, and, and statistical neighbour positions. So we, uh, we're, we're catching up in, in that sense. In terms of the proportions going through, um, we're currently looking at around 80% of those requests for assessment are being accepted, going through that statutory assessment process. And, and broadly, you know, 90% of those or, or thereabouts will go on at that point. Um, and, and be issued uh, with an education, health and care plan. And, and those rates very much in line with, with the national position. Um, so the, the vast majority, once we hit that request for statutory assessment, um, will, will be accepted and, and almost all of those will then go on uh, to, to have plans. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Peter? OK, yes. Excellent. Excellent. Um, Ron, Councillor Tyndall, you, your hand is up. 
I can't hear you. Sorry, if I may, to finish off uh, very quickly, uh, David uh, in his statistics mentioned something which I'd like to follow up with. He, he said that we've now got the data that can indicate trends of, of those that are uh, going through our systems, uh, which will be obviously of great benefit to adult care services. And I just wondered in what percentage increase do those trends show leading up to sort of uh, adulthood when adult care services kick in? Is there a steady increase at the moment, uh, uh, David, which obviously will have Im uh, financial implications for the council going forward? So in terms of the uh, the banding that I was referring to at the moment, that's um, for mainstream uh, pupils uh, in, in school. Uh, yes. So work is underway to extend that to the 16 plus. And I think where that's significant is it will give us much more intelligence about the young people who may not be open to, to the 0 to 25 social care uh, team and therefore uh, those who, who will uh, immediately hit uh, potential eligibility for, for adult services. But it probably gives us more intelligence about the, the cohorts below that who wouldn't necessarily um, be known to those 18 to 25 services or, or adult services, but at a later point, um, you know, see, see that escalation in need. So I think that's a, a, a bit of a slow burner on that one. Um, but, but I think uh, the other piece that's relevant is that uh, work around transition data that Danny talked about in terms of the PFA work stream, uh, which is certainly something we can bring back to a future meeting. Thank you, because I think that would perhaps be crucial for us, uh, uh, this committee, uh, certainly in, and panel, certainly in terms of future budgeting as we go forward, uh, because learning difficulties, as anybody knows from looking at the annual budget, uh, is coming up to about half of the council spend in adult care services, which uh, uh, and obviously does have an impact. So uh, I don't know whether Helen's got any follow up to that. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I, I was going to. Uh, well, I was just reflecting on the conversation about the, uh, the the sort of strategy and the particularly the relevance for adult care services, the 18 to 25 cohort, and welcome the chance. I think to work with Joe on coming back to you with more information in due course. And yes, um, our expenditure on uh, adults with disability services is um, is more than half actually of the expenditure of of the um, adult care services budget. So we're always mindful of, of those pressures and uh, continually wanting to look at options for um, managing that budget pressure, which, which, is, um, which is significant. I think partly it's about the transition in from younger people's services, from children's services, but also very much about really positively um, the fact that people with learning disability, with physical disabilities are living longer and longer. And so we have, by virtue of that good news story, an ongoing demographic pressure. And I think that's probably some of the information we could bring and present back to panel uh, when we come along to uh, to sort of work with Joe on that. But also, I think fair to say that we jointly oversee um, that 18 to 25 um, cohort. So perhaps we could um, give panel more information about how that's governed, how that's organised, uh, and hopefully provide you with assurance of our oversight on those issues. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Helen. Thank you, Chair. piece of equipment muted me all on its own. So no further hands up. I'm going to look to take this now to um, formal recommendations. Unless there's any further discussion or questions around this for the team. I'd like to thank Joe and Danielle for presenting today. Truly a big, big thank you. An incredible amount of work has gone into this. It's an ambitious strategy and um, we are, we're, we're here for you. In the future, we look forward to more details on the 16 to 25 year olds, completely understand um, 
and it's an ongoing it's a never it's a, it's a situation that never sits still one day someone's 15 the next day they're 16 and and it, it, they, they hardly know the difference it's just the night's sleep that takes them into that that next era and we complete it we're, we're there with with you and again I, I thank you again for the amount of effort and work you and your team have put it have, have put into this and and, and um look forward to seeing 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 this one grow I'm going to form formalize the words now and go to the rec um, our, our recommendations for the for our vote um the adult care health and well-being cabinet panel is asked to note and comment on the draft draft refreshed um send strategy and endorse the approach to stakeholder engagement and the associated timeline for delivery to cabinet can we take a vote on that panel please if you could just do it in the in this in the um the chat response noted got ron tony richard agreed leslie nigel helen thank you peter and fiona So that is unanimous and will be recommendations followed through and passed, passed on that. If we can move to the next item, take a deep breath in, clear your minds, move away from the previous two. Another exciting capital programme update. Looking forward to, to um, asking Helen to present our operations director for older people services on this and thank you helen when you're ready thank you chairman um morning everybody um i'm also here with uh, with a few colleagues who may want to chip in at various points uh, in answers to any questions so emily white who's joined us from our property team uh, we're working really closely with corporate property services to move this agenda forward um, I've also got on the call today Jackie Albury, who's our Assistant Director for Planning and Resources in Adult Care Services, and so uh, very, very much uh, concerned with the, the financial side of this, the financial aspects. And Mark Harvey's with us as well, Operations Director for Adult Disability Services, so typically the younger um, area of, of work that we cover off in adult care services, and, and you'll notice that the the report picks up on our strategy for accommodation for those younger adults. Um, so it is a cross-cutting update for panel on a number of pieces of work that we've been pursuing for some time now. Uh, and in terms of having a new panel, we thought it'd be really helpful to bring you up to speed with what has become an increasingly important area of work for adult care services. So it's pretty much a, a, a pricey really of all the work we're doing. Uh, it's entitled Capital Update. It takes you through the various ways in which we're using the County Council's capital resources to drive improvement, quality and transformation in the accommodation offer that we might make for people. So by way of prefacing, I think it's probably worth me saying that much of the report discusses different forms of accommodation. And I think it's critical to set the context for that in that the quality of the bricks and mortar where people live, their homes, is a key way of enabling a good care and support. So it's our overriding ambition in adult care services for people to access that good care and support in their own home, where their independence can hopefully be maximised as much as we can possibly uh, achieve. That's not always achievable for people, but it is our primary goal. One of our other duties is about getting value for money uh, and using the Hertfordshire taxpayers pound effectively. So we're keen to look at ways in which we can use capital, particularly laterally, to help mitigate the significant revenue budget pressures that we face. We've talked about all that, that already in terms of uh, the demographic growth of the county, um, the ageing of the, of the population and the sort of cost pressures that that brings for the county council. So how we might use capital to offset some of those cost pressures has been part of our thinking. So in section 2.4 of the report, you have the current allocations for our major capital work projects um, that were set out and agreed by county councillors in the 2021-22 integrated plan. And as I go through the report, I kind of touch on each of those in a bit more detail. 
So I'll quickly whiz through uh, each of the service areas and then open it up for your questions. Section five of the report focuses on our strategy for older people, people typically perhaps with dementia and frailty related con concerns, conditions. Um, and our strategy, as I say, is about facilitating independence. One of the key planks of that strategy has been to facilitate the development of more extra care housing in the county. And extra care is about groups of apartments, communal facilities and on-call on care and support when needed. So the report highlights that we've got a number of existing schemes, which we tend to call flexi care, just in terms of our jargon. Uh, and we've got work to do to review those existing schemes and make them uh, fit for the future. But it also reports on the work we're doing to expand our provision to attract new providers into Hertfordshire. Um, and it picks up progress against the business case that this panel saw back in October 2019, which then went on to Cabinet. And that case gave us the, the permission, the incentives to work with providers to come into Hertfordshire and develop new schemes. Uh, the council might use its own land or award grant funding in order to achieve that. So the paper talks about how we're working up a pipeline uh, and particularly updates on, on the most advanced of the schemes, which is a, a, a development in Broxbourne. In section 5.13 onwards of the report, I cover off residential and nursing care. Um, I think importantly here is our nursing care strategy. Um, we in Hertfordshire need to be able to purchase more nursing care for people who live in the county. There are areas of Hertfordshire where provision is is either um, not enough provision or is not adequate in terms of quality. So following the strategic review back in 2017, we've been moving forward with a programme of nursing home building and talk in the report about the Wormley development, which will come on stream later this year, and two more schemes that are in the pipeline. So we're intervening directly to improve drive up provision. Uh, and then we need to think once we're going, once we're through those three schemes, you know, where we go next, how do we continue that work to develop more provision? In section six of the report, we turn to the younger age group, uh, adults with disabilities, physical or, or learning disabilities. Um, we start, we, we're, we're working hard in that area to expand the provision of supported living accommodation in the county. Supported living again gives people that independence, choice and control. Care may go in on site. Uh, increasingly, our thinking there is about moving away from larger institutional type provision to more small settings, one or two flats perhaps in a, in a, in a housing development. Um, so lots of work to do. We've uh, got some projects that are underway. Mark may be able to update on any of those, but we're also developing a strategy. And in that strategy, we'll certainly reflect on the work we need to do with our in-house stock, which will need to be uh, brought up to standards, be fit for purpose, fit for the future over the next while. Uh, there's a brief mention in the report of two of the two of the day services where we're looking at reproviding. And then the final section covers mental health um, and our duties for social care related mental health uh, support are delivered by Hearts Partnership Foundation Trust, HPFT. Um, they have a number of properties which are owned by the County Council, which can be used to support their service delivery. Some of those properties no longer fit for purpose. So our strategy there is about disposing of those properties which no longer suit our needs and using resource to invest in what's called intensive enablement facilities. So a place where people can go, get the support they need after a mental health crisis, get back on their feet and then return to, I hope, life in the community. So some interesting work there, again, facilitated by the Hertfordshire County Council's capital resources. Chairman, I appreciate there's a lot there. It's a, it's a massive programme of work, so, but I'll stop talking and open it up to questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, it's a massive task. It's a, it's, it's worth a, a, every part, every bit, bit of investment. Um, questions. So, the, I've got 
Can, I've got um, Fiona, councillor guests, hand up in front of me, and then I've got Ron, councillor Tyndall. Thank you, Chairman. I think that councillor Tyndall did pit me to the post, so I'll do the decent thing and give way to him and um, ask my question after his. Well, I'm happy to. It's all over Fiona. to you, Ron. All right, thanks, Stella. I was happy for Fiona to go here. Not to worry. Yeah, I, I, thank you, Helen. Uh, very good report and extremely con uh, well written and concise. Thank you. Uh, and also, your presentation was admirably shorter. Uh, could I just. I, I've always admired the way in which we provide the provision of, of uh, accommodation in this county by owning the, the bricks and mortar and, and then getting service providers to uh, staff it, such as quantum care and others such as that. Uh, because one of my great dreads at the moment is if the government doesn't get its act together, which seems unlikely, then uh, there some private care providers may stay full, might, might start falling over over this next coming year or two and and then there'll be a great pressure uh, on the council to do something about it and and we'll be in trouble so i just wondered uh in paragraph 2.3 it's mentioned that we we could go into partnership uh providing capital funding and i just wondered if that could be bottomed out a bit, because I would, what I would ha be happy with, I'm not against uh, working with providers uh, of any description, providing they meet our terms. But what I'm concerned about is that we retain the, uh, and I'm thanks to my colleagues for pointing this out to me, we retain the ownership of the establishment, the bricks and mortars, so that if the care provider does uh, fall over financially, uh, we can't have the premises taken away and put in the pot for distribution to the to the debtors. The, basically, the premises have to be returned to us so that we can continue to serve our residents. And I think that's extremely important. I do have another point on nursing, but I'll come back to that. But if, if, you, if, if I think that's a key point of the way our strategy has worked in the past. Thank you, Ron. Yeah, and I might bring Emily in on this one because I know in terms of extra care, particularly where the council's making its land uh, available for the development of schemes, we've been very mindful about um, you know the, the, the terms on which that land is released, and uh, Emily's been clear that you know a, a leasehold type arrangement would be. Uh, much more sensible in terms of protecting the council's interest. But so I'll, I'll come back to Emily. I'm sure she can fill you in more on that. In terms of uh, the work we've been doing on nursing homes, yes, you're absolutely right, Councillor Tyndall. You know, Quantum Council owns those homes. There's a significant <clears throat> portfolio there of, of residential homes. So that's um, something that's an asset that the council has and can use that asset in the furtherance, I think, of its strategy. Um, interestingly, the quantum contract comes up for renewal in a couple of years' time, so we'll have the opportunity to think through how we want to approach that. Um, the new nursing homes that we're developing, um, again, on the premise that the council will retain the ownership of those um, sites. Um, I guess the interesting thing for me is that um, we've been able to invest that capital. We'll get that capital repaid over time as the operator will um, pay as a return, a rental for using that premises. And also we'll be able, we hope, that's, this is the vision, to um, secure beds in those settings at preferential rates in the marketplace. So for me, you know, that's potentially um, a, a good solution, a win-win really all round. It, it covers the capital costs, but it also keeps our revenue pressures under control. So, yeah, I, I agree your point, Councillor Tyndall. I think it's important for the council to retain the, the utilisation of those assets where it possibly can. I suppose that with that comes the responsibility of being a good landlord. And I think um, in terms of some of the stock that we have around the supported living settings, we've got work to do as a landlord to think about how we make those um, accommodation uh, places fit for the future, really. So it will require us to invest going forward, I think. Um, Emily, anything to add? Uh, no, I think you've covered it really well, Helen. Um, the only thing I'd add potentially is just the fact that we also have to be conscious of the market that we're in and making sure that we can still drive interest from providers to work with us. 
um, whilst maintaining the position that we want as well, which is one of the things we've had to look at quite carefully on the extra care, where generally the market has tended to want freehold assets. And as Helen has referred to, we've been looking very much at looking at long leasehold interest being granted so that we can retain control over the use and ensuring longevity of that use for the residents of Hertfordshire as well. Thank you, both of you. Uh, can I urge that we actually keep to our strategic model that we've had for the last few years and retain the assets? Because, as I say, if, if private providers fall over, then fine, we have the mechanism, which again has been created by our excellent staff, to, to, to go in and take over from the provider and keep going if we've got the assets. If the assets are the ownership of the provider, then we lose those as well and then we are in trouble. So I think over the until the government sorts itself out, which could be some years yet, I think we need to make sure that we are we are uh, future proofed, if you like, by hanging on to what we have. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's probably just worth me saying, Chairman, if, if it's OK for me to just come in uh, around that extra care work. We are acting as a facilitator, so we're, we may be giving um, a proportion of what it's going to need to make that scheme fly. Um, a, some land because land's a barrier in Hertfordshire or some grant funding to make the sort of business case stack up. But, but we won't be in the position of being the outright owner of the building. I think, Emily, is, that, is it that's a, that's a fair reflection of the position um different on nursing where we are funding the whole build and then we'll obviously keep that asset on our books thank you very much chair thank you thank you thank you for helen for your response to get to councillor tindall on that on the details of it um fiona is your hand down uh i've taken it down because You'd already noted that I put in a request to speak, but I'm still ready to go to speak. Now that Councillor Tyndall's done his stuff after he got there first. Would you like to speak? I would indeed. And please, please. My question is really about extra care housing. And that is, how are we working with the districts and boroughs at the moment on it? And how are we going to be doing so going forward? Hello. So, um, th thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Guest, for the question. Um, so, we have, um, our, you know, we've got good relationships. I think it's fair to say with uh, with district councils around this agenda. We've created about three years ago a strategic. Let me get the word right. The strategic, no, a supported housing strategic board, which brings together all of the housing authorities in the county council in the in the area, along with county council officers from adult care services. Um, and we have a good forum there for sharing our goals, our ambitions and, you know, um, opportunities, I suppose, for working with district councils around this housing agenda. Um, that board is supported by a number of district boards again. So, for example, I sit on the Well in Hatfield District Board where we district housing, supported housing board, where we can look at individual opportunities, at schemes, at, at tensions, at issues that crop up around housing and social care as they do tend to from time to time. So we've got really good dialogue going on. We've also got opportunities to influence the broader planning decisions, considerations, criteria of Hertfordshire. So we have an ACS officer that sits on the corporate officer growth group. So really well plugged into overall thinking about the development of Hertfordshire in the round. I think also fair to say that at those district boards, we often have planners uh, in attendance. And again, really good opportunities to think about, you know, what's happening in terms of the delivery of local plans. Are there sites where districts are looking at master planning and, and having the consultation, having the discussions with them about what we might want to achieve through those agendas? So I think it's a process of working together in partnership, trying to influence the agenda, building good relations so that we can, uh, so that there's a good understanding of the ambitions that we have for people. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Nigel, Councillor Bell, you have your hand uh, Thank Yeah, thank you, Chair. And I too also support the uh, 
uh, more having more extra care housing in the county. On flexi care, uh, you do say, I think it's going back to 5-4, one, uh, 1,649 flexi care places in Hearts across 24 schemes with 723 uh, having care needs and 98 voids, that's 821. So you're saying the other, the, the, the rest are, aren't necessarily care needs as such. So how are the... Um, what what is the basis of the other um, the, the the rest of the figure, and also um, uh, on uh, mental health care and support needs, are we trying to make sure that this is um, uh, also spread out in the way that they're they, 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 they're built across the county? Um, and just if I can get in on the little first site in Three Rivers and another the site in Stevenage. Uh, are we looking to open up other, um, uh, you know, homes like that across the county as well? Thank you. That's a list of questions, Helen. Yeah, written them down. So FlexiCare, our existing stock. I think um, we've got some work to do as commissioners in older people's services to undertake a review of that FlexiCare stock. So some of the new schemes that we're intending to bring forward, I think, will deal with probably some of the scenarios where that stock is probably a little bit tired, not that fit for purpose going forward. Um, sometimes when we aren't able to find an individual to go and, um, you know, take up residence in that stock, then the, the housing authority will place someone there from from their sort of uh, housing register so that that will be the balance I think of people um, I think there are some disincentives at the moment in the way those schemes operate the charging policy um, is is I think a little bit counterproductive there so as part of a general review that we're starting around our charging strategy we're wanting to look particularly at what we do around charging for extra care um, and I think there's probably more work to do around how we market, how we push out the message that uh, that this type of housing for older people is a good opportunity. Okay. Uh, so uh, mental health. Uh, so um, the integrate. What's it called now? The the yeah. intensive enablement facility that we're looking at developing. Um, we we have one already in Stevenage. Uh, and so that's covering half of the county. The ambition is to get um, a, a similar development in uh, that can provide in in the other half of the county. So that they're not facilities that will be springing up, uh, you know, in on uh, mass. But we do need. We think we need two to cover yeah. the county of Hertfordshire. So that the second facility will hopefully equalise that provision. Um, and around a little furs again well it, it, it's sort of about um deficits in particular areas whether that be deficits of provision so the wormley scheme in particular uh, responding to the fact that in broxbourne there was um there wasn't any nursing provision for us to access um little furs is in a similar situation also influenced by the need to support um, people coming out of Watford Hospital. So it's in a really good site from a sort of intermediate care point of view. Um, Stevenage is all about deficits of quality in the Stevenage market. Mm. Um, and so it's going forward, the job of commissioners to really keep an eye on each of those district areas and to understand the specific characteristics of those areas and what we need to do. So in some areas we won't need to intervene as 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 uh, as powerfully as we have been doing in 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 Little Furs, for example, um, it's something we need to keep under review. Commissioners are constantly monitoring and updating their models. Um, as I said at the beginning, the the quantum discussion, which will start to shape up in the future, may give us a new direction of travel around that. Um, so um, the the three home program that we have got the got the backing for from members um, uh, will need to be assessed at the end of well, not at the end of, but as we're getting to the delivery of that program, we'll need to then take stock of where, what next really, and what our strategy will be for delivering that, whether it's by direct delivery or by using the levers that we have at our disposal. Well, okay, that's clearer. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Have any further conversation around, around the, this program for taking it forward for, for, for the support? First of all, thank you, Helen. And, and and team for, for, for presenting this to us today, my um, detailed report on, on the capital programme. Great vision is shown ahead. 
and lots of support. We look, I hope we look, we look to support you um, every every step of the way on, on this. And, and the, uh, the the people that are going to benefit from this magnificently is the residents of Hertfordshire. And um, I commend, commend for that. Um, I'm going to formalise recommendations. So cabinet panel is invited to note and comment on the update of the Adult Care Services Capital Investment Programme to help deliver good care and support services for our citizens of Hertfordshire. Can we take that to the meeting chat to note? Thank you. David has noted. Teresa, oh no, not Helen, thank you. Screen goes down. Tony. Uh, noted and commented. Okay, so recommendations and it has been agreed. Thank you so much, everyone, for your energy put into that in, into that particular item and and concentration as well. Now we're on two hours. I've got no messages in my chat. Do we break? One and a half hours. Everything. We're only at one and a half hours, Chair. One and a half two hour. hours and one minute on mine. That's mm -hmm. you. One hour. Yeah. Uh, that's because that's that's you, you were there for so long before. Down. I just don't want in case in case I went over, that's fine. I'll wait for Teresa for you to advise on the timing. All right. I've got a different time, but have we been on screen here? So I don't want anyone to say Stella. Mm. And he goes right. to prove you were there half an hour before we came. Actually. Yeah, St. Albans time is ahead of us. Yeah. <laughs> Always. <laughs> Always. <laughs> Take that any way you like. Okay, right. We have the Adult Care Services Annual Complaints Report. I don't like that word complaints, but we have it um, for 2020 to the 31st of March 2021. Um, Ken Begal is um, our complaints manager, is going to present to us. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, panel. Um, yes, so what I will do is I'll go through the summary of the report um, and then obviously if, if anybody has any questions, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer them. So if I just start going through with the summary. Um, so I know we said it's the complaints report, but actually it's the complaints and compliments report um, because I do value uh -huh. the good work that staff do. So, so I always start with compliments first. So the number of compliments that we received last year was 270. This is slightly down by 6% from the previous year when we received 289. Um, in terms of total representations that we received, 254. Uh, and again, that was quite down from the previous year when we received 351. So 27% lower people came forward to make a complaint. Um, and, and I know there was a lot of work going on um, with staff because of COVID. So I think a lot of these, uh, the figures are probably a lot lower compared to previous year because of COVID. So obviously, I think next year will be a better indicator of uh, complaint numbers compared to last year. So in terms of formal complaints, we received 207. Um, and again, that's down 33% because a previous year we had 311. Um, total number of informal complaints, we dealt with um, com informal complaints from the 254, 47 were dealt with informally. Um, and the previous year it was 35. So, so what I think what the services have tried to do is try, because of COVID, try and manage any low level concerns as quickly as possible to avoid them escalating and to ensure they're meeting the needs of the vulnerable client group that we work with. Um, so in terms of acknowledgement timescales met, 92% uh, of complaints were acknowledged in time uh, compared to 89% the previous year, which I'm really uh, pleased to see. Um, and, and in terms of response times in 10 working days, um, as you will appreciate, social care is quite a complex 
area. So trying to get somebody to respond within 10 working days is usually fairly, fairly difficult. But we managed to get 44% of our complaints responded to within 10 working days, which, which is a credit to the hard work the staff have been doing. I appreciate slightly lower than the previous year when we had 49% dealt with within 10 working days. But obviously the pressures on the services because of COVID would have mitigated some of that. In terms of response times met, because in social care we have between, um, well, from as soon as we get the complaint up to 65 working days to respond to a complaint, because sometimes some of the cases that we deal with are extremely complex, in terms of total uh, time scales met, it, we only had 82% that were met within the time scale. That is better than last year when it was 81%. But I think it's an area as a complaints manager, I will looking, I'm looking to focus on more and try and improve that because I'd like to get that up to near the 90%. So going into findings, so when we respond to a complaint, it's it's either justified or not justified. And the way we uh, record these are whether it was upheld or not. So 17% of the complaints we received last year were upheld, um, and that has gone down compared to the previous year when it was 20%. In terms of partially upheld, 18% were partially upheld, uh, and again, that's gone down from the previous year when it was 19%. Not upheld have gone up to 45%. Um, and that, again, has gone down from the previous year when it was 51 per cent. So um, the, the process for um, adult social care is we do an investigation and then we do a senior management review if the complainant remains unhappy with the initial response. Uh, last year, we had six senior management reviews uh, compared to the previous year when we had five. And once uh, a complaint's been through our process, they are then signposted to the local government and social care ombudsman. So last year we had 18 complaints go to the ombudsman uh, and that is down by 18 uh, percent because the previous year there were 22. Um, I also would like to remind the panel that because of COVID, the local government ombudsman's office was actually closed for three months. So when we had the initial lockdown last year in March, they, they weren't taking any more new cases on and they weren't actually pursuing the cases that were already in the system. So it, it's possible that next year's annual report, uh, there'll be a bigger increase in LGO social care complaints. But I think that will be a backlog from last year. So just to summarise the summary, <laughs> um, the reduction of complaints is mostly due to reduction in new referrals and also cases being managed proactively during COVID-19 pandemic to ensure vulnerable service users continue to receive services and remain safe. Upheld complaints continue to remain low. Local government and social care cases have decreased, highlighting the good work undertaken to resolve complaints uh, to the complainant's satisfaction. So that in a nutshell is the summary. Um, is there anywhere else that you would like me to go through within the report? Panel. And provide further focus and, and detail? I think what we'll do, what we'll do is we'll 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 pick up through questions, all right. To, okay, that's and, fine. And we'll 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 steer it through through the questions, okay? That's, that's all right with yourself. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um my first hand that I have in front of me is Helen Councillor Campbell, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much, uh, Commander, for the report. Um I wondered if you could tell me what, what is meant by representations, please. Um so representation mem is members, officer, uh, members, social workers, or is it something no, I, I don't no, understand? <laughs> I, th Thank I think we, we, we say representation. So if somebody comes forward and says, I'm unhappy. So, so they're being dealt with as complaints. But as you could see from the summary, from, from how many representations we had, a certain number of complaints went to, through the formal process. And there was a few small percentages that went through the informal process. So, so it, they're assessed once somebody comes forward to say we're unhappy. 
you know, is it is it something quick where a social worker should have turned up, uh, done a visit and they didn't? So you wouldn't put that through a lengthy complaints process because, it, you know, as you can appreciate timescales for a formal process, it's longer. So we encourage staff where they're very low level, if they can pick up the phone, uh, try and resolve it there and then it's dealt with informally. So so that's one example of, you know, the representation is somebody's unhappy, but okay. how we then pursue that will depend on what are the actual issues. <laughs> Thank you very much. And as you've been speaking, I've just realised that the number of formal complaints and informal complaints do indeed add up to the number of representations. <laughs> Glad to hear that. <laughs> Thank you. Math, math has never been my strong point. No, seriously, I hadn't. I hadn't actually attempt I hadn't even looked at that and I hadn't it hadn't dawned on me so thank because, you very much because, yeah, yeah within this report we don't include council inquiries we don't include uh, um, MP inquiries that they're, they're dealt with in a separate process by the director's office right okay. these are mainly yeah. formal people that have come forward to make a formal complaint and, then, and obviously they then get siphoned off by your yes. offices I understand thank you I have one other additional question which is about the acknowledgement time scales yes um, I'm assuming that those acknowledgements are not automated because if they were then that figure would probably be 100% so okay. if they're not automated, um, ca well, sorry, am I right that they're not automated? Well, uh, there's there's different ways that channels that we receive a complaint. So if somebody came to the complaint team within the complaint uh, adults inbox, we have an automated acknowledgement. So we receive a receive a, a communication an acknowledgement will go out straight away. So that uh, so that's one of the reasons probably we've got a high acknowledgement rate but then we also receive services will receive them and we have three working days within which to decide what process is it going to follow and acknowledge it and send the acknowledgement out so so and and because some of the complexities we receive in some of these cases it, it sometimes goes outside the three working days uh, but yes ideally if we could have everything coming through one channel only they would receive an acknowledgement straight away and you would get 100% acknowledgements done in time. Yeah, I absolutely understood that that, you know, because of the nature of what you're doing and the way that that uh, representations, I'll now use that word, <laughs> the way that they come into your system, I absolutely understand. It was just just something that jumped out at me because if you report something simple like a tree, uh, that's a problem in a different department, you get an automated response back and then obviously your acknowledgement response can be 100%, but that's completely different. And, in and, this, that's, this and that's, you know, I, and I've, I've worked with my colleagues corporately, regionally, nationally, and, and, and I think social care is a much more complex area. It's not, it's not an area that we could make quick decisions on always. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much indeed for the explanation. Thank you. Thank you. Fiona, Councillor Guest. Thank you, Chairman. Now it's been highlighted as to why the number of complaints has has changed. It's been highlighted as to why the number of, of complaints has gone down. That's formal complaints. The number of informal complaints has gone up. Do we know the reasons behind that? And, and like I said to you, I think it's a lot about, I mean, it, it, it really does vary what's going to come in year on year. So, you know, because of COVID, I think staff were obviously working much more closer with vulnerable people to make sure that if they were unhappy, that they were making sure that they those were being dealt with quickly basically and, th and that's all it's down to really uh, and also that we've received a low number of complex cases that had to be formalized oh, thank you for explaining thank you fiona thank you again um councillor um tony councillor kingsbury uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, just a, a comment to start with. Uh, obviously, the number of complaints have, have gone down, but um, it's quite good to see that the the number of compliments have gone down a lot less. And um, sort of working with things like this is is we always struggle to get compliments, so that's really good. Um, I might be getting confused now, but my question is: on the formal complaint findings, there are three categories, and the the, the percentages don't add up to the total, don't add up to 100%. Is this something to do with informal ones or? It, it, it's it's to do with informal ones, but it's also some uh, yeah m mainly due to informal. It's not ones. another category or anything. That, no, that it, no, there's no other kind. Of category. It's just they add up to ninety or eighty percent, I think, yeah. which seems. And, and, and because there's a percentage that were informal, so that, that would be the rationale. So the percentage of the overall complaints, not the percentage of formal complaints. Okay, thank you.
Thank you. Count Richard, Councillor yes. State. Yes, thank you. Uh, good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you for your report. Um, can I just preface my, my question by expressing my disappointment? I understand the pressures that COVID and the pandemic has placed on everybody, but it is disappointing that something as important as an ombudsman's office, uh, in, in essence, ceased to function in areas where I know we do everything we can to resolve these disputes and these problems. But I, I, I have to say that's a very disappointing piece of information. And uh, I can clearly see it, it, it will undoubtedly impact upon next year's report uh, and probably adversely because of the catch up situation. Um, I may have missed it, but I cannot find it. So I'm going to ask you, do mm -hmm. we have a percentage of the uh, or any understanding of the ombudsman's uh, resolutions in respect of the complaints that actually were dealt with by that office. Um, I mean, clearly it's important that, 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 that the best percentage are found in our favour and not against us. And I couldn't, I couldn't actually find that. I may have missed it, but the uh, uh, the, the problem with ModGov is on a small tablet that the, the, the writing is very small and the eyesight isn't getting any better as I reach towards 80 years of age so yeah, that's that's not a problem and Child. yes they, the the information is there so if you go, if i can direct you to page 10 it, within the report uh, i'm happy to read it out for you as well that's not a problem so um the, the from the 18 um complaints that we had that went to the local government ombudsman they decided not to investigate seven out of those um, because they obviously felt that we'd handled them um, appropriately and they didn't feel that they had anything further to add. Yeah, got it. Um, I found it section eight and I I, I missed it and apologise. But that's, uh, that's not a problem. That's um, not a problem. <laughs> it is there and it's quite clear. Yeah, and I can see fully that it's, it's detailed. Thank you so much. No problem. Richard, thank you. Where is he? There he Ron, Councillor Tyndall. Thanks very much, Stella. Uh, Brian, uh, hi. Uh, thank you for the report. Again, very good uh, and very clear and easily understood. Uh, I'd just like to keep the theme going that we started with this morning and looking at page uh, 150 in the pack, uh, paragraph 53, which is the uh, the the uh, <coughs> The, the uh, where are we? I've got it. Yes, yeah. Uh, the not to twenty five group. And yeah. I, I just wondered, uh, are we? we uh, there are. Uh, hang on, I've missed 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 my statistics. Forget that. I'll just go straight on to ask: Are we actually at the end of the process uh, issuing a, a, a sort of uh, a bulletin through the whole department, learning the lessons? It's something that the police complaints uh, system does. If there is a significant case or something that occurs within a police service somewhere in the country, they, they, they issue a, a learning the lesson sheet, which then uh, advertises it to everybody that uh, something went wrong, this is what happened, and, and this is what you should do to make sure it doesn't happen to you. Do we do something like that? What, what I'm doing is I'm linking in with the Practice Governors Board, with Mark Harvey's team, and we do look at, we'll be looking at the annual report and we'll be looking at how that any of that learning can be taken forward. Um, but we do make sure within teams that they learn. But uh, but from what you're saying across the board, absolutely. And the, the practice governance board will be the area within which we do that. Right. Thank you. And, and the only other question is I've actually got my brain working again. Uh, it's actually uh, paragraph 5.3 on page 151. Uh, <clears throat> the 0 to 25 together complaints. And there were nine that we've finished up with, uh, with the others being managed, uh, as you've described earlier. And I just wondered, what sort of areas did they cover? Uh, I've always been very keen that we do what we can to get these youngsters into uh, into employment or ed education of some description, or actually even doing some voluntary work, something that occupies them rather than just being a 
So I just wondered what the nine complaints were about. So, so they would have been more about social care uh, and transition from children into adulthood. So, 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 so they, yeah, so, so, so they're, they're not just social care, they would be working with education as well. So, so there's sometimes a number of strands to the complaint, not just one area. Okay. But, but when they're over 18, they come into the social care annual report for adults. When mm. they're under 18, that, that information is presented within the children's annual report. Lovely. Thanks very much. No problem. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I have, I cannot see any further hands up or any... Peter Hebden. Sorry? Peter yep. Hebden. Yeah, thank you. Um, Thank you. I'm just looking through the, the, the complaints report. Yeah, you have my total sympathy um, because uh, well, in my previous life, uh, after retiring from the police, I worked for the NHS and spent a couple of years as the complaints manager for the South of England for primary care. And people can complain about absolutely anything, never be satisfied with the response. Um, and, uh, and, and, so, and some some cases that are um, suitable for uh, like an, an informal resolution, you know, sort of they, they sort of want to, um, you know, they want to see blood. Um, now I'm, I'm looking through the uh, the the complaints. I mean, a lot of it is, ju is just uh, statistics. Um, one of the problems I found when working for the NHS was that it was a a complaint that was. Uh, probably close to a critical incident or a, or a, a never event um was given was given the same time time frames as um what I might call a customer service complaint mm -hmm. um so, so so do you do you actually um sort of grade the complaints in in in, in seriousness at all um what we do is frame? Yeah, what we do is at the outset, we would look at the complexity of the complaint and within the acknowledgement that we send to the individual, we will then tell them how long it's going to take us to investigate it. So rather than grade it, I mean, we can grade them green, amber and red, green being informal, amber being formal stage, uh, you know, investigations, and then red being like safeguarding, um, serious instances, like you've said, Peter. But Within this report, I appreciate that's not there, but I think a, a majority of the cases are generally um, dealt with as formal complaints. And where there is a safeguarding instance, we would try and wait for that process to be completed before we start the complaints process. Obviously, we don't want it to interfere with other processes that are ongoing at the same time. And, and, and this report um, presumably includes, well, it's, it's adult care, so it includes care homes, Absolutely. And, and as well. Absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, because I, I I went to uh, a care home in Hatfield a couple of weeks ago. Um, to uh, it, was, it was a mayoral event and um, all safely spaced, of course, out, outdoors. Um, I, and I I introduced myself as uh, to, to to the manager of the care home as as a uh, as a new county councillor and um, and being on the on this on this uh, on this panel. And I, and I, I said, to, you know, what I said, what, what could the county council do better, or what could of the council, uh, the county council have done better to support you through the pandemic? And, and I was expecting a, a long list um, of, uh, of issues. Um, and, I, and I can only say that the care home manager was effusive in her praise for the county council um she said she, this this care home manager was was actually new to the role not not new to the care home but new to the role of, of care home manager sort of two months before the, the the pandemic started and she said that the county council could not have been more helpful and more supportive than than had been the case and that and and when she was comparing notes with her colleagues in in Berkshire and Bedfordshire um they did not have the same experience so um mm. i think it's worth i think i just think it's worth mentioning that yes we get lots of 
complaints. There will always be lots of complaints. But I think it just shows that if if this lady, if this care home manager put that down in writing as uh, as a compliment, that, that would be one. <laughs> that would be one compliment. But when everything can be done so well, um, it, it it does tend to go to, to go uh, um, unacknowledged as well sometimes. And I think with the compliments, I think the I, I certainly hope that any compliments are brought to the attention of the staff and managers, because council staff very rarely get uh, get compliments. And um, I, I actually went through the uh, process myself um, of, of sorting out funding for my mother's care um as she had uh, after many 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 years in care had finally reached the uh, the threshold um and my my dreams of a uh, a new sports car were dashed um the uh i found the process not difficult but 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 time consuming and um and slow but I didn't expect mm-hmm. it to be uh, fast, quick and easy. Um, I think the the amount of paperwork that I had to uh, gather, for instance, to, you know, sort of um, getting bank accounts and all the rest of it. Um, I, I can understand why some people would have complained. Because it 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 was it was a little bit complicated and some people will need help with it so if somebody makes i I notice a lot of the complaints are about the finances Mm. about finances and assessments so i didn't need help with it a bit of help from my wife maybe to get it sorted but I, i i didn't need help with it but there will be a number of people who need that help and if that need is identified earlier then that would hopefully presumably sort of negate the the, the reason for, it, for people to complain because so are people flagging up complaints about the finance about the process early or are they just sort of giving up on it and then um, and then complaining as opposed to asking for help at, at an early stage we, we do get people come through asking when they don't understand it they usually around we didn't know we had to pay. So we, we've had a number of those over the years. And one of the things we've done in Hertfordshire as a learning, for, for me as a complaints manager, complaints are about listen, respond and improve the services that we provide. So we will look at the repetition and we will look at the data. And some of the complaints we were getting previously were about we didn't know we had to pay. And staff would say, well, they were informed. And one of the things we sat back and looked at was, well, actually, when your loved one is going into care or they're ill and they're in hospital and they're going to go into care, you're actually not in a good place. So if somebody tells you something, how much of that do you digest? Um, so what we did was, yes, workers speak to them at the time, but we've also developed a leaflet, which then they, is given to them for them to take away. And when they sit at home, they can read it. Uh, and understand it better better so so we do looking at depending on what the trend is so you know absolutely right in finance we look at the trend and then we look at well how many are we getting like this and what else can we do to improve that so we do look at learning and there is learning within this report as well towards the end of the the uh, the report and the report so yeah absolutely we look at that and um people do have advocates so if we have vulnerable service users, they would have an advocate to support them. Um, so th- there are support services out there that, uh, you know, services would bring in if they needed them. But also our finance officers, when they're doing the assessments, they work with the individuals and they're very clear about what sort of information they need in order to be able to complete the assessment. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for sharing that. Thank you for your response, Cam, um, to that. Um, Ron, Councillor Tyndall, your hand is up, yeah. shine bright. If I may, uh, I've got a question, but first of all, can I follow in from from uh, uh, what our office has said? Because we, we're very fortunate in this county because uh, we fund, the county funds two organisations, Hearts Carers 
Hearts Help and also Power also received support from the council. And both of those run advocacy situation, uh, advocacy services and represent uh, carers and also those in care. So uh, ultimately, we cover both ends of the spectrum. We actually help to finance those that are complaining against us. So I think that's a very good situation and very principled way to behave. Uh, moving on to my question, and I'm very grateful to Peter for raising the comparison between ourselves and other other counties, because that illustrates the failure of the government in supporting adult care services through the pandemic. Uh, the guidance was virtually always late. Uh, PPE was almost non-existent at the start. Uh, there was the discharge into care homes without testing. There was all sorts of things that uh, the NHS was well looked after, but the care, care service came very much a, a, a second thought to the government. And it was only the counties who stepped into the breach. And in Hertfordshire, we, our excellent staff actually did that. And so uh, you got the praise from the care home you did because of the way our officers responded to plug the gaps left by the government. And also, you also heard about what happened in other counties where they didn't do that. So I think that is a true demonstration of the failure of the government over the COVID period on supporting care homes <laughs> and care services. And they're still doing that, but not coming out with their plan. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Leslie, Councillor Greensmith, Smythe. Um. Leslie. Screen's gone. Leslie? Leslie? Okay. Um, ba bum bum. Couple of seconds. Leslie? She's disappeared off the um, screen. Oh, that is a shame because we're in a position. Oh, actually, switched off. Right, I've come back in again. Great. She's Sorry there. about that. No problem. Um, it happens. It happens. <laughs> Very good to hear what Peter had to say. Um, not in this area, but in a London borough, I had a very similar situation dealing with an aunt with dementia who had no dependents at all. And it's very good to know that there is a help in Hertfordshire because I had to try and sort out all her problems and as I say she got dementia and it was very very difficult to do that so I can see why people will complain because I kind of understood what I was doing but I can understand that there are lots of people that, that are not as savvy and sort of sure about what they're doing with things and we did get to the end of it but I can sympathize with people and I can understand why they would complain about things like that. So very well done to Hertfordshire for supporting people like that. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you for, for that. Any further, any further questions or sharings on, on, on this one? It's very close to a lot of people's hearts, quite, quite, quite clearly. Um, and yes, hearts can counsel absolutely rose. Um, to, to the challenge that, that there's no doubt it's a mag magnificent absolutely magnificent work was done by everybody everybody everyone that contributed even by turning our laptop on one day and just saying yes I'm I'll be there to help absolutely well done and we you know hi history will show will, will show exactly um, the, the, the benefits and, and how well cared for every, everyone was re regardless of what you said Ron um I now need to formalise. So, sorry, formalize. Chair. Sorry, Chair. Just quickly, can, can I ask Camel? Please, if, if, sorry, can I interrupt there? Can, can I just ask Camel if she can please um, feed my, view, my 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 thoughts back to Absolutely. to the staff? I will oh, do. Please, thank you. Please note sorry, that sorry, in Stella. our yeah. minutes as as well. Formalise that in our minutes, please. And that a, a, absolutely. So, Cam, let to. To thank you for your presentation today and the and your transparency as well. Really, really appreciate it. Um, I take it forward as the complaints report. What I'd like to see is the compliments and complaints report because I think that's a, that's that that provides a better balance visually to the eyes, even on receiving it. Um, we learn 
absolutely from our complaints, but we also learn from compliments as well. You don't put the compliments in the drawer and not no. refer to them again. You put, you get the compliments out and think, what did we do here? What, where, why, why what, what, what was this one? It's that. So I, I think with, there's equal learning from both to be had. And I think compliments and complaints can all go in, under, the, under the same title. But I'll leave that one with you. That's not Thank you. That's my, 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 my thoughts there. And the next few years, I'd like to see positivity attached to um, negativity as well to, to help to help to help the balance. So I won't I won't loiter on that one anymore. The recommendations um, panel um, as to vote for um, to vote to vote for this report in, in, in the chat, please. It's there. We're we're there. We're there. Thank you so much. So this report, the report is um, noted, and and agreed. Thank you. Thank you. To, hello. I just said thank you. Oh. Bye. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Right. Item six on our agenda. Adult disability services. We have a sh um, short breaks review update. And Chairman, we've yes. reached, reached four minutes past 12. Do the panel wish to continue through to the end on the last item or do they wish to have a break? Up to you, panel. I'm happy to keep going. Yeah, keep going. I suggest we keep going. Yeah. Yeah, happy, yeah, I, yes, continue. Yeah. Someone is yeah. Agreed. Down for a couple of seconds, so, so be it. Um, Mark Harvey, please. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And good afternoon, panel. Um, so uh, thank you for providing feedback. I, I've come today with uh, an update on what was the closure programme for our short break services of three units, um, a, a process which started back in 2020. Um, I've been previously February 21, sorry, 2019, February 20, we came back with an update and this is a, a further update to let you know where we are with the programme, uh, the impact COVID has had on it to a certain extent, but to provide you some detail on terms of transfers, um, the closure dates, where we are with the closures and the outcomes for individual families uh, across Hertfordshire that were implicated by this programme. Um, I suppose firstly I'm, I'm, I'm conscious not everyone will have been involved in the original process and uh, conversations at Cabinet Panel uh, and subsequent calling actually where we set out the proposals that we did for the programme. So just by means of a, a very brief update the purpose of the programme was to uh, look at the usage of our eight short break units across Hertfordshire, six of which are run by the County Council or were run by the County Council, two of which were commissioned services on fundamentally what was a block contract with the private sector um, and the ongoing data we had around the underuse of those eight units um, and very low capacity alongside uh, some of the conversations that you've had on, on previous papers around what young adults and families of young adults were doing uh, for their short breaks and their support around their carers needs where we were starting to see an increase in other types of respite short break provision use of direct payments growing uh, and less use of our internal short break units. So the programme was designed to um, fundamentally release unused capacity uh, from those short break units, um, which resulted in the recommendation of closure of three units, two of which the County Council runs, one of which was a private sector commission, um, and with the programme then to roll out to ensure that everyone in those units got an alternate, uh, appropriate and viable and personally set up uh, short break units, uh, short break response that met their needs, whether that be a transfer to another short break unit um, or whether it's an entirely different approach um, that the family and the individual themselves wanted. Um, as part of that programme, there were 112 people impacted by the closure of the three units that we proposed. Um, that number has actually significantly come down to the point of looking at alternatives to about 74. And on previous updates, I have gone through and I've set it out again in the paper um, just so you can understand where we went from 112 down to 74, which was predominantly about people choosing to take on supported living 
um, to take on direct payments. Um, or what we actually found, a lot of people that were noted as using short breaks weren't actually using them. So there were allocations, they were logged on the systems, but actually we have a number of examples of people who never actually used the short breaks that were allocated for various reasons. Um, and so we've done separate work with them to ensure that one, if there is a need for short breaks, we're doing it and we're doing it the right way, or we're finding out the alternates, or in some scenarios, people didn't actually want the short breaks to, to go forward. Um, we are now in a position where the three units that were identified have all now officially closed and are taking no further uh, referrals uh, or people accessing short breaks. It's fair to say that this programme uh, running over a COVID period uh, was significantly challenging and on two occasions um, we paused the programme. So as soon as the first outbreaks and the uh, pandemic kind of hit us as a, as a sector and as a country, um, we wrote to all families and paused, completely paused, uh, the program um, so that actually one our workforce could be focusing on much more urgent things but also families weren't having to worry about this during a period of, of a very unsettled period for them as well. We then re we restarted the program in November um, and continued the second phase from January onwards obviously also had a further impact and what we did was rather than stopping the program this time is that we removed the cliff edge of a closure date so we had a set closure date of uh, March um, we removed that and agreed with families that we would run a rolling closure date so that we would close those units at the point where everyone um, was either satisfied with where we were or had an alternate short break placement uh, put in place or an alternative care package. So there was no pressure of time both on our workforce but more importantly on the families who are using our short break services. Um, uh, that seems to work quite well in that last phase. Um, there is no doubt there is certainly a couple of families where we've not um, probably been as responsive as we could or should have been through that period and we, we've acknowledged that and taken on board those individual cases and worked very directly with the family. I've had conversations I know local team managers have um, and I'm fairly reassured that we are where we are now with most people uh, in a position of understanding where they are already in receipt of their uh, alternate um, short break services. So just a very, very quick um, run through of the, of the data as it stands. So of the 74 that needed something different, 44 are already completed and accesses alter alternate short break services within the, the remaining six. Um, and their offer is exactly the same as the offer that we provided previously. There's been no reduction in their short break allocation. Um, four are due to start. Um, I suspect some of them may have started at the time of writing this report. Um, this is quite a fast moving programme. So four were due to restart um, short breaks and alternates. I think that's probably up and running. Um, there are four individuals that are still um, in discussion and that's around making sure we've got the right care arrangements for them um, in those short break units so their needs can be met. Um, however, there is alternate care provision being provided for those individuals um, where that has been requested so that there isn't a delay in any care and support for the carers uh, needs really in, in being able to care through the COVID period, but also without the existing short breaks. Um, and there are 12 cases where the families have requested to not be involved in any further conversations around alternate short breaks right now. Um, that is for various reasons. We have looked at every single one of those just to make sure um, we're doing everything we can as an alternate. Some of these are individuals that never actually use the short break units, even though they had an allocation. Some of them are for wider personal issues in, in the family. Family, um, and some people because actually they don't want to access or be involved in planning at the moment because of the concerns they have about COVID uh, and the spread of COVID in the short break system. All 12 of those are remain open and allocated and in close conversation with social workers so that we are um, certainly there and available for them and the minute they want to look at short breaks as, a, as an alternative that will be picked up and responded to but we do continue to provide care and support for those individuals as well so it's not that we've just closed the case or, or are not providing anything uh, available to them. So the position we are in now, we are moving to the closure of the of the programme overall uh, in terms of delivery is that the, the three units have now closed. Um, there are technical pieces that need to be done in relation to deregistering them, notifying CQC that they are no longer active short break units um, or in receipt of people. But for, uh, for fundamentally, they are not receiving referrals now. Um, and the uh, Turing Road, which was the one which was a commission that has now fully closed and we're working with the uh, provider and the owner of that service uh, to look at alternate 
supported living, which, as you saw from our capital papers earlier, is our preferred delivery of uh, services going forward. And it's highly likely that a number of the people that used to go to Turing Road will take up some of those supported living options there because they had such high allocations. Um, they were, were fundamentally living in some of the short breaks units as it was anyway. So offering them the right supported living where they have tenants in control um, is probably going to be a much better outcome for them as individuals. So, Chair, that, that, I appreciate that was a whistle-stop tour. Um, it's a, it's a programme of two years, I think, we're, we're in now, um, and happy to take questions or clarify any points. Thank you, Thank Mark. You, Mark. Thank you, Mark, for that presentation, for your presentation. Um, there's, many, there's many hands up um, for on this, starting with Nigel, Council, Councillor Bell, if you'd like to ask the questions. I'm just going to slip off my chair and get a lead. OK, thank you. So I thought it was Ron first, but yeah, it's just to say, um, all right, this is over now. But I mean, this did leave a bit of taste, I know, to quite a lot of par parents and families. And uh, we, we remember what happened last year. And uh, we did get the feeling that, uh, you, you know, the, the, the administration wanted to make this one million pound cut and they were going to make it uh, however way in the end. Um, I appreciate that, uh, ironically, because of COVID, I think uh, it was extended and extended. And in the end, I think that's ironically what, what's actually forced the issue for many parents and many families. Um, you know, I appreciate now that you said you've talked to, uh, uh, you know, all those, the 112, and that's come down to 74, et cetera. But on the other hand, we talked before about compliments and complaints. There are many, I know that there are many uh, parents and families who it often isn't, for, even if they're not using a service, it doesn't necessarily mean it's because they don't want to. Often it's not properly advertised to them. There are often families who don't fully know what they can access. Um, and I think that's often re the reason why some families, whether it's adult care or in children's services, who are not fully taking up um, a place at uh, respite or any other um, facility that county are, are operating at. Um, and I know that uh, there were issues, for example, about tenors would about whether it would be properly ready and fit for purpose, especially for wheelchair users. Can you tell me whether that is now the case for wheelchair users at tenors would? Um, so, as I say, I appreciate all right, we, we've got to where we are now. Um, but and you're saying that you know, all the families you've, you've checked up on them all now. And, OK, we are where we are. But um, I do think you need to learn about the way this was uh, pushed through. And obviously we had the vote last year and there was a bit of controversy, but I think we did the, the, the administration and everybody needs to learn about how this was all handled. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll leave it there. But if you could let us know about tenors would anyway. Thank you. Yep, no, no, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bell. So uh, in terms of Tanners Wood, yes, we did some works at Tanners Wood. Um, we are fairly clear that it is fully accessible to uh, people who use wheelchairs. Um, what we do need to do, and we have to do this in all our buildings, is to make sure that we don't have five people who use wheelchairs at the same time, for example, on a site. But that's, that's, that's the same about any of the supported living units or short break units, uh, making sure that we have a good mix of individuals. But it is fully accessible um, and that shouldn't be a barrier to anyone accessing it. Um, can, I, can I just pick up on the point around advertising? Because I think that that is a key one. And that was uh, certainly some of the feedback when we did the two consultations with the public uh, on this. And I know that certainly our, our own internal county council short break services, which had it headed up by Stephen Lee Foster, um, are working on on that quite a lot now so we have produced lots of promotional videos um, we are targeting uh, younger adults that are coming through from transition so they can see the units there are um, live video links so you can go and have a tour you can talk to the staff etc um, so we are we are definitely trying to improve the advertising uh, we've got of those short break units as well as every other type of respite and short break we offer so um, it, it is quite wide now what families tend to choose so we're trying to make sure we do get that but certainly a point of learning and we will continue to try and improve on that Thank you, Mark. Thank you for your for your for your response. Um, Ron, Councillor Tindall, you're you're Thank, thanks very much. Hello, Mark, and welcome Hi. welcome back from the corridors of power in Whitehall. I, I hope you managed to teach them a few things about adult care. Uh, however, uh, moving oh. on. Uh, uh, can I say, uh, yeah, we, we've travelled this road together, and and while. I think, you know, I would associate myself with some of Nigel's remarks. I think at the end of the day, the the, the purpose of actually satisfying the individuals, because every person with learning difficulties or other disabilities are individuals. And I don't think we should ever treat them as a group. And so 
and I think that was part of the problem. And uh, but I think the way you've you've come to it uh, and and explained it on the, uh, in the paperwork has has actually resolved the problem. What I'm particularly interested looking forward is in uh, in three point six paragraph three point six. Uh, you're you're introducing a new service wide booking system, and I just wondered about the timetable for that, and and uh, whether or not you you've actually got a grip now on the demand that uh, that that is going to be needed to cover the, that once once it's put into action and and it is advertised. Sorry, Councillor Tinder, I must apologise profusely. I got kicked out of the session and I've, I've had to dial in on my phone because the Wi Fi has just gone down in, uh, in my part. Don't one. worry, Mark, don't I'll, worry, breathe. Keep yeah, uh, it, I was referring to paragraph 3.6, Mark. Uh, uh, is there a time scale for the new service wide booking system? And uh, have you got some idea of, of, of the demand that's likely to be triggered by uh, the. Uh, once you you've got your advertising campaign into action and 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 so that we can satisfy the demand um yes yeah, so in terms of the booking system uh, i met with our in-house services yesterday they are they're mapping it all out they're about to work with families about what works for them uh, the project is for that full booking system to go live at the beginning of the next financial year but between now and then to them to be testing it on on services as they go across um, to make sure what see what works for them as individuals um, as in terms of demand um, the we're not seeing a huge increase in demand from our advertising so we will we'll keep doing that what we are going to do is now do some more direct mapping uh, and understanding with individuals particularly younger adults and their families because that's where we would tend to see the growth uh, in, in use of respite those that are, um, are older adults uh, tend to be using respite now we already have plans so where we might see some some growth it will be much smaller um, so i think if, if i'm honest we need to do more work to understand our projections that we did when we proposed this program at the moment, we think are still quite sound, so we'll see a growth in short breaks, but not as, as big a growth as we will direct payments and families choosing alternative approaches. And even when we looked at this programme, lots of families are now starting to choose things like shared lives, respite provision, of which we have quite a reasonable amount available in Hertfordshire, or direct payments where they bring in PAs, so people don't need to leave the home, but the family might go away for a weekend for a break, but the individual may stay at home with personal assistance, etc., and just carry on living as they would do normally. But certainly it is a, it's a piece of work that is ongoing around future demand, particularly for young adults in that transition phase. What I'm just conscious what we could do is that the request for us to come back with children to do a joint paper <coughs> in the 18 to 25 areas, that I, I think it would be useful if I build into that paper for some of our thinking around carers needs as well as just the, the individual young adults uh, which might answer the question in a bit more detail for you council thank you very much martin thank you chair thank thank you ron fiona councillor guess please thank you chairman thanks mark mark in your presentation you answered the question that i've got formulating in my mind about the 12 who'd pulled out of planning at their request. So thank you for answering that. And in your presentation, you mentioned that the two in road building is likely to be repurposed for supported living. Although we're digressing slightly now, would you be able to keep the this panel informed of the progress on that, please? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, one of the things we could do, so we will be coming back to panel in the near future around an accommodation strategy for adults with disability. So we can certainly build into that some of the progress and the projects we've got, but more than happy to keep you updated on the progress of the development of Turing Road. Um, and you know, it, the Turing Road is also our building, so it will be uh, part of our stock, but we will be looking at new care providers and some capital programmes to modernise it for that purpose. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Am I unmuted? Yes. I didn't mute it. I don't know what's going on. Remnants in the system. Paul, Councillor de Kerr, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's just a question for Mark. It was triggered by a specific uh, element, bottom of page 160, but it's a general question, obviously. I'm, I'm not going to get into that. Um, there's reference to one individual at Apton Road 
uh, where the family and and the individual have not yet agreed um you know that the, the alternative um pattern and they're, and they're they're still getting some some provision there although the unit has closed i was just what do you know this is the general question going forward what is i guess the legal position if we have to do this in the future is after obviously periods of consultation and discussion and offering can a can a family effectively refuse to agree i'm thinking of some sort of filibuster where they just do not wish to go down the alternative routes because they don't accept the closure of what may be a particularly favorite um center for them um so so i think in principle a decision by family to not take an alternate wouldn't stop the process happening uh, okay. particularly in somewhere like respite um where people are coming maybe once every three months for example etc mm -hmm. so um we we would always ensure that we meet our statutory duties um, we we offer something that will absolutely meet the family's needs, etc. Um, and and as I say, and hopefully in all cases that that's a completely acceptable alternative okay. to to the individual and, and the family. But it wouldn't preclude us actually uh, completing the program. Thank you. And I mean, you, you seem to have done it very well because there's only one of those at this point with all those difficulties through COVID. So yes, it was just just more from my understanding. That's really helpful. Thank you. Any further questions or or conversation? around this item. Well, first of all, thank you, Mark, so much. I know you've had IT problems and well done for struggling on through and getting over them, ju jumping the hurdle and uh, going, going to alternative. But now in, um, I'm going to, we recommend that we um, note Chair. and, sorry? Uh, oh, Ron's hand was up. I don't know if you want to speak again. Ron. No, I've just taken it down. I suddenly apologize. I, I, I left it so. up. Oh, I was just taking it down. You thank were... you. Okay, okay. All right, I'm going now to recommend that we note um, this report and if you could put your response in the chat and, and, and appropriate comments, be grateful. Thank you. Ron noted, Teresa, Richard, Peter, Helen, thank you. Fiona and Tony. Nigel and Paul. Leslie. Maybe she's out again. Okay, there's there's the votes are there. So the report is noted and agreed. And Mark, thank you so much and thank you for, for all your hard work and everything you, you do through it. And thanks for that presentation to today very much on, on short breaks. Thank you. Following through, panel, um, have I got any other business that wants to be raised? None for me. With us? I know, I can feel our laptops are starting to sing. Richard, no? Yeah, I had to, I had to recharge mine too. <laughs> I know, I, I can feel, I can see the lights going, the battery <laughs> starting to arrive. We've done well, we've done well. Um, okay, given that, then I'm going to, no other um, business notified. The date of our next week meeting is Wednesday, the 8th of September. That feels a long time away at 10 a.m. So thank you, panel, for this morning. Thank you for your contribution, your effort, and the, the work, the pre-work you do before you come to panel. Really appreciated and the time that you all put into this. Uh, up. The energy. Richard. I'm just, sorry to interrupt, but I have just consulted my diary and I've got it as Tuesday the 7th, not Wednesday the 8th. Have I, um, am, am I wrong? Someone help me. I have, I've got Wednesday the I've 8th. I've got the 8th down. I've got the 8th down. Okay, I've, it's, it's me then. I'll be there, whatever. So just, just direct me and I'll. What's, what's a day between yeah. friends? <laughs> can, can, can I just ask is, is this going to be on the 8th? Is that going to be on Teams or is that going to be uh, in person? I think what we'll say, Peter, because we haven't been told any different, we're on Teams and we'll, be, we'll, um, we'll see where life is at that point. Well, I know where I'll be. I'll be in Yorkshire. Uh, so you said, you said, I saw you. I saw you. Yeah. Somebody has to be. Teams, you may be able to, if you I'll choose. Be, I'll, to. Be, I'll be in God's country. So it's just a question <coughs> of um, 
whether uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'd be quite happy to uh, get away from the in-laws for, uh, for three hours to uh, to discuss. I don't Can't care. Comment. They may they may be watching. <laughs> Too much. Uh, they won't be watching. Too much. <laughs> I, I, I'm supposed to be in Turkey, but I doubt that, that will happen. <laughs> well, obviously, if it's going to be in person, I'm going to I'm going to. Uh, we'll but, take uh, it nearer the time. We'll be told. We're directed. We'll see post next Monday where <laughs> life takes us. And regardless, we'll be here either on screen or um, hopefully in person. But if not, um, if you're off on your holes, have a good time out there. Relax as much as you can. And for heaven's sake, stay safe. Stay safe. We're still in a pandemic. So look Thanks. after yourselves. Thank you, Chairman. Bye. Thank you. 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 Have a good day.